There's no psychological trait that shows zero genetic influence. You know, personality is a little less heritable than, say, cognitive abilities. I mean, not a little, 40% versus 60%. Kindness is just as heritable as everything else. And what's that number? About 40%. That means 60% is not heritable. But then again, that non-inherited environmental component is not nurture. The 3 billion base pairs that are similar among all of us is what makes us human. But it's that 0.1% of the DNA that differs that makes us different. You know, it's just a very small portion of all our DNA that differs, but that's responsible for all these differences we see. Dr. Robert Plowman is a world-leading behavioral geneticist, best known for his role as the principal investigator in the Twins Early Development Study, or TEDS, the largest and most comprehensive longitudinal twin study ever conducted. Twin studies work by comparing identical and fraternal twins. Identical twins come from the same fertilized egg and hence share 100% of the same genes, while fraternal twins share only 50%. By comparing similarities and differences between these two types of twins, scientists can estimate the influence of genes and the environment on behavior for the entire general population, not just twins. It's actually a really cool scientific methodology that's gifted to us by the evolution of twins. 100 years ago, almost exactly, the first twin study was done. It's like a natural biological experiment. The adoption method separates nature and nurture, and that's more like a social experiment. We're describing what is. We're not saying what could be. We all have thousands of genetic risk factors for schizophrenia. It's just if you have 10,000 of the risk factors, you're more likely to be schizophrenic. But even then, it doesn't mean that you will be schizophrenic. It's probabilistic. Parents matter, but they don't make a difference. That means don't make kids different. How much support you provide doesn't make a difference. You know, you need some evolutionarily expected average level of care. But beyond that, it doesn't make much of a difference. It's not a factory producing good little citizens. It's a relationship. And like with your spouse, if, if you have a relationship and I said, well, she's pretty good, but I can shape her up. You know, I can make her into a more interesting, intelligent person or whatever. I mean, that's a disaster, right? But that's what we do with our kids. Yeah. And if you had been in the maternity ward and the wrong parents took you home, what I'm saying is that you would be very much the same person that you are today because you're, you're genetically identical. And it seems... It seems crazy, except that there's data. This episode with Dr. Plowman was one of my favorites that I've ever recorded. We tackle controversial topics like the impacts of parents on personality, the heritability of traits like weight, divorce, and intelligence, as well as the future of genetic testing and genetic manipulation. Before we get into the podcast, I have one favor to ask. My YouTube analytics state that 95% of people that regularly watch the Giant Shoulder podcast are not subscribed to the channel. My goal is to get to 90% by the the end of the month. If you're interested in expanding your knowledge of the brain so you can better know yourself and others, then subscribe to the channel and follow the Giant Shoulder podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Now, on to the episode. I promise it's a really good one. Dr. Robert Plowman, it's an absolute honor to have you on the podcast. We were, we were speaking just before we clicked record there that behavioral genetics has always been a fascination of mine. I had an incredible module in college about it. And there are so many topics that I want to dive into. I really think right. this is going to be a master class in all things genetics. And there's so much to learn on these topics. Bobby, but let's good. start You're from the very start. And, <laughs> let's start from the very start and bring people through. Because there's a lot of terminology, a lot of vocab, and it's mm. a huge field. So let's, let's start at the start. What is behavioral genetics? Well, behavioral genetics, is the, as the says on the tin, it's the genetic study of behavior. But in a way, it's... It's an adjective, behavioral genetics. So it could be, it's the same as medical genetics and anthropological genetics or neurogenetics. Do you know, it's, it's using genetic tools to study uh, these, any complex trait. And, uh, and so that includes what people usually think of behavioral genetics as twin and adoption studies, but it's very much the study of DNA these days, but DNA is a tool. And you can use that to study behavior or medicine or neuroscience. You know, so behavioral genetics isn't just lim limited to twin and adoption studies. It includes all of genetics. And that's what's so wonderful about the field these days is you're not this isolated field. Our problems are the same problems that all complex um, system sciences have, you know, especially neuroscience, but all the 
major medical problems and the illness load in society. These are all these complex traits that we've learned are all influenced by genetics. So you want to use the genetics tools to learn as much as you can about these traits. Yeah. The main the main takeaway I got from your incredible book, Blueprint, is that these DNA, and we'll go into it a lot, but have quite a lot more impact than I think pretty much any of us realize. And yes. a lot more impact that might be comfortable to accept for a lot of people as well. But we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. What, what are the primary methods that we use to, to study the behav behavioral genetics? Well, 100 years ago, almost exactly, the first twin study was done. And that you compares, it's like a natural biological experiment. We have two groups of twins, I'm sure most people know that there are identical twins, monozygotic, born from a single fertilized egg that divides in the first few years of life. But these twins are actually clones of one another. You can sequence their DNA and their inherited DNA variations are identical. And then the other group of twins, two thirds of all twins are fraternal twins or non-identical or um, dizygotic. They're separately fertilized eggs so like any brother and sister, they share 50% of their genes, but they are a nice comparison because they grow up in the same womb at the same time in the same family. So the twin method consists of comparing the resemblance on a trait. Say, take a trait about which we know not much, like musical ability, say. And if you can measure it, you can then say, well, if there's genetic influence on individual differences in musical ability, you have to predict that identical twins will be more similar than fraternal twins because identical twins are twice as similar genetically. So that's the twin method. And the other major method was just first published um, uh, four years later called the adoption method. And that's more like a social experiment. If you study regular families, they share genes and environment. Now, we all know that. First degree relatives are 50% similar genetically. But for a long time, psychologists especially forgot that. You know, they just assumed that what runs in families runs in families for reasons of nurture, not nature. You know, that's basically Freud. People say he's kind of biological, but really he felt, for example, even when I was in graduate school in the 70s, you, you read that schizophrenia is caused by what your mother did to you in the first few years of life. And, you know, environmental hypotheses are always reasonable. But you got to say, but wait a minute now, they share 50% of their genes, so maybe there's something genetic going on here. So the adoption method separates nature and nurture, which usually runs together in families, by taking genetically related individuals, say birth parents and their uh, adopted away children, who, who share genes just like any parents and offspring, 50% of their genes, but they don't share nurture, they don't share family environment. So these are biological birth parents who relinquish their kids for adoption at birth. And then you study these children and ask about their resemblance to their biological parents. The, the design everyone's familiar with is identical twins reared apart. So here are genetically identical individuals. And there's a few hundred pairs that have been found that were reared apart. And so that's kind of like a direct estimate of the extent to which genetic influence is important. So for 100 years, twin and adoption studies were the major designs used, not just in behavioral genetics, but in medical genetics and anthropology. But then the, the DNA revolution happened in the about almost 20 years ago it started. And that's to use DNA itself, not these indirect estimates of genetic influence, but to actually get DNA differences and say to what extent do they predict behavior. So that's the DNA revolution, and that's what's changing everything in medicine, for example. So there's a lot of new things happening there that are taking advantage of what we have learned from the DNA revolution. But it basically confirms what we've learned from a century of twin and adoption studies. And that is first, that we've gone from thinking nothing's heritable, nothing's influenced by genetic differences. And that wasn't a positive belief. It was just sort of by default. I mean, nobody studied genetics. It was all environmental. Yeah. And that changed partly because the early work was done in the 20s. And then we all know what happened. In, well, in the 30s, you got behaviorism occurring, which was environmental for reasons we could talk about. But the worst, of course, was Nazi Germany and eugenics. So in the 40s and 50s, it was verboten to study genetics, you know, it just wasn't the thing to do. But it eventually started coming back in animal research. And then by the 
And it was just sort of like if you were a psychiatrist and you were seeing these patients and you see most patients had relatives who were affected and you're saying it doesn't like with schizophrenia. And, you know, you, you look at the family and it's not some horrid family that mistreated the child or something like that. You, you can't help but take a more balanced view that it's not all n nurture, that surely nature has an effect. And animal studies were very, you know, showed very convincingly because there you can, the two major animal methods are, we actually select for a trait. If it's heritable, that means you can breed for it. And that's really what an animal breeders have been doing for 10,000 years. They kind of knew that. So that's kind of the proof of the pudding of genetic influence. But there's also methods, too, where you, you can breed these special strains of mice, and they differ genetically, but they're like identical twins within a line. And so yeah. that's another method that's used. But in the 50s and 60s, animal studies really began to show everything's heritable. And so in the 70s, you know, it was still kind of dodgy to talk about genetic influence in psychology, but it was a real turning point where the, the masses of twin and adoption studies began to take us from the view that nothing's heritable to realizing that everything's heritable. And we've reached a point yeah. now by the 90s where the first law of behavioral genetics is everything is heritable. That is, you can't find a trait that's reliably measured that does not show substantial genetic influence. It's not just statistically significant genetic effects, which is what we have too much of in the behavioral sciences. We've got to ask about the effect size. And we're talking about, on average, half, 50% of the variance of the differences between people on all traits in psychology is due to inherited DNA differences, which is astounding because, you know, in psychology, if you explain, away. If you explain five percent away. of the variance, that's really big. And, you know, people just don't realize if, and that's 5%. And now you take 50% of the variance. There's nothing like it. I mean, as you were saying, you were surprised by that. Well, I think we were all yes. surprised by it. You just couldn't expect that what you inherit in the first cell with which you began life, that's the same DNA in the trillions of cells in your body. And somehow that inherited DNA has shown through over the complexities of development and the complexity of biological systems. I mean, it really is astounding. I think I think it's a fairly easy it's a fairly easy thing to accept in obvious cases of physical characteristics, say things yes. like eye color, shoe size, height. Yes. Weight was a surprising one to me, but we can get well, to that. But yeah. there's a few that I think everyone everyone is like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But the ones that really surprised me were like were things like divorce. Um, yeah. probability of watching TV or your watch hours watching TV. And this yeah. is in cases where the child didn't grow up in the same household as the parent and they were raised apart. And somehow there was still a correlation between things like probability of getting divorced, watching TV. Like these are physical manifestations of like, it's hard to even piece together how the DNA can have an influence on those things decades down the line. In some cases, yeah. four or five, six decades. But when you understand the answer to that question, you understand a lot about the way genetics works. So you take something like, I, I published that first study on uh, genetic influence on television viewing in children because it, it was being perverse a bit and I knew it would get a lot of flack, which it did, but yeah. it's held up, you know, everything's heritable. And part of the problem with divorce and especially TV viewing um, TV viewing has been used in thousands of studies as an environmental measure. How much TV do kids watch? What kind of TV do they watch? That's the environment. You know, the, that's the TV out there and the kids watch it and it affects them. It affects their adjustment or whatever. But now we say the question I'd like everybody to always ask is, yeah, but what about genetics? So if you think about it, um, you, you know, P parents don't make their kids sit in front of television. I mean, increasingly, they make them not sit in front of television. But the kids watch what they want to watch to some extent. And increasingly now, where a lot of kids have their laptop in their room and they watch television as they wish. It, and, um, and so it's not just a matter of the environment being forced on you. A, a lot more of the environment is the experience of selecting choosing to watch TV or not instead of playing football or modifying the environment. You, you sort of watch TV in the background as noise, but you're really doing something else. And then actually actively seeking um, your environments. 
that's the way genes work. It's not like they're hardwired. You know, that, I knew what was going to happen when I published that article in the 80s about genetics of TV. There were going to be newspaper stories, the gene for watching television, do you know? Yeah. And, you know, it makes you bang yeah. your head. But I have learned that uh, a little bit more sympathy for journalists because they don't have much control over who writes these strap lines, you know, which are meant catchier. It's going to get, get more clicks. clicks. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. um, and with divorce, you could, we could use that as a little quiz for the audience. So with television viewing, you know, it, it's substantially heritable, maybe 40% heritable. We found that in twin studies. We find it in adoption studies, where, as you said, the amount of television that adopted children watch is much more correlated with the amount of television their birth parent, whom they never saw after the first year of life, watches. So it is mind boggling, but I hope people can see how that can happen because, you know, people are different. They have different interests. And and so let's think about divorce now and say, you know, that's kind of used as a prototypical environmental measure. But then anybody who's been divorced, and I've been divorced twice, you know, it's not something that happens to you. You're not just walking along and somehow divorce comes up and you get hit by divorce. You know, it's a relationship and relationships change as people change. You You can see that when you say that, I hope it's clear that there can be personality characteristics involved in that. You know, that the, the divorce isn't an event, it's an experience, and it's experience in which we're involved. It doesn't just happen to us. And this is true of yeah. all the environmental measures, like the ones that are used the most are life stress measures. And, you know, again, these are because they're called environmental measures, people say, oh, well, that's the environment. And we think of the environment as out there affecting us, but that's not the way the psychological environment works. It has to do with experience. And that's where the genetics comes in. So the big items, uh, the top items on life stress events uh, scales are things like having financial trouble, getting in conflicts with people. Well, you, you can see that isn't the environment out there. That's you interacting with your environment. And the you of it is where the genetics comes in. You know, some people are just a yeah. lot more irascible and they're going to have more conflicts with people. And, you know, it's just personality. And the neat thing about divorce is there was a study showing, uh, an adoption study in Minnesota, that showed that the characteristics that might make you an attractive partner in a relationship might be the same characteristics that make you more at risk for divorce. And by that, I mean things like, <laughs> you know, being, I mean, I made this mistake early in my love life with, you know, as an adolescent, girls who are wild and crazy, you know, and want to do wild yeah. things, they're fun to be with, you know, but then they are, absolutely. Um, yeah. that can be dangerous for day-to-day -day living and decade-to-decade -decade living, you know? So yeah. um, it's interesting that the very things that might make you genetically influence things that make you attractive might also be the things that make you more liable for divorce. Yeah, no, it makes complete sense. But I, I think the real struggle that people have with this, or the real struggle I at least had with this, is that they don't attribute their personality and their psychological traits to their genetics, to their DNA. I think that they mostly attribute it to their experiences to the fit like to their the fact that they overcame their struggle when they were five and you know they tripped at the start of the race and they caught back up and you know whatever experiences people go through in life i think most people think that those events are what shaped them into who they are today yep. i mean yep. wrongly it seems by the data but fair enough i mean it's a re environmental hypotheses are always reasonable but yeah they're basically wrong if you don't think genetic influence is important and that is you know, a real important thing for understanding yourselves. And then as you get to be a parent for understanding your children, it's just so important to recognize they're 50% similar to you, but that means they're 50% different. And what you find as a parent, there's this famous aphorism that parents are environmentalism, but environmentalists until they have more than one child. So that with the first child, say she's very shy, you, you, you ask parents who have a shy child, why are you shy? Why is your child shy? And they give you one of two answers. That's every time. It's either I took her out too much when she was young, or we didn't take her out very much when she was young. You see, opposing yeah. hypotheses, but after the fact, you know, they're reasonable. But then when you have a second child and that child's 50% different from the first child and from you, you're likely to have a child who's much less shy because, you know, so then 
you see these differences between your kids early in life and you say, you know, I didn't do that. These kids yeah. came with some differences. So that's why they say parents are environmentalists until they have more than one child. And this famous Finnish author, Karl Ove Noskar, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he wrote this. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar. Okay. 7,000 page, five volume series of sort of his life. It's called, well, unbelievably, it's actually called Mein Kampf in German, which is my struggle, but it's sort of my about his struggle, life. Yeah. But it's like proof, psychological proof. It's time, time for stuff. a book title change at that point. Time for a yeah. quick title change he in writes, the book at that point. He writes in like proofs about minute details of life, you know, like a cup of coffee and drinking a cup of coffee. But he, the passage I remember is like 45 pages describing his four-year-old girl's daughter's uh, a birthday party she went to. And he describes all the people around, you know, all of that. He's just brilliant. And he had three kids. And he actually said he was trained as a sociologist. And he was, you know, this is just environmental. It's just tender, loving care is all you need. And your kids grow up fine. But he had three kids when, as he describes them, they're about as different as three kids can be on just about every dimension, yeah. sports, personality, you know, music. And so when you have more than one child, you, this really comes home to you. But for everyone, it's an important distinction that important thing to know that genetics is a lot more important than you think. And OK, maybe it's hard for you to understand that personality is heritable, but it is. And psychopathology is heritable. So if you're easily depressed or you have other sorts of personality tr problems, rather than beating yourself up, you need to recognize that you're given the normal wear and tear of life, you're more likely to succumb to some to like depression and so you need to think about that and say it, it's not that you're a, a weak-willed person or something it's just harder for you the trait that yeah. i really see on that is is um weight you know and fat shaming and that sort of thing um so we can get into that later because that's part of the dna revolution but yeah i'm glad you brought that up though because um i, I think you're right um we've done surveys of people and they think there's some uh heritability, genetic influence on per personality, but you're right, not nearly as much as, say, certainly as height. And yeah, as you said, weight is surprising to people that it's quite highly heritable, but then also cognitive abilities and learning ability. You know, when people are at school or if they're teachers, you can't, can you help but notice that some kids just learn more easily than others? You know, it, it doesn't yeah. take a, a fancy IQ test or something to figure out that some people are just a lot brighter, however you define it. They solve problems quicker. They get there faster than you. And, you know, so I think at some level, people must recognize that their genetic influence is pretty ubiquitous. But if they don't, then they don't have to believe me, but at least keep it in the back of their minds that heritability, genetic influence accounts for about half of the differences between people on all psychological traits. There's no psychological trait that shows zero genetic influence. Yeah, which is a, which is a crazy stat and worth worth repeating. I, I think the I think one of the reasons that this is such a difficult thing for people is that I think there's some innate wiring. I'm curious to get your perspective on this. There seems to be some innate wiring in humans to want to apply agency to things. Like I did A and that caused B, to have a direct cause and effect mm -hmm. between our behavior and our actions. And at least if we can have that n narrative rationally straight in our head, we're, we're fine with that. And maybe B went wrong, but it was because of C. And it's almost never that simple and never that case. But just the way humans are wired to think, we like those simple, I made a mistake, a mistake here, next time I'll improve. They don't like relinquishing that agency, which is what attributing some of it to genetics and DNA would do. But there's a lot of positives to take in that as well, which is to oh, But on that point, stress. I know that necessarily does follow, you know, that if it's a single gene, see, part of the problem is that people learn about genetics from Mendel and single genes. He studied seven single gene characteristics in pea plants. Now, a single gene is hardwired and deterministic. You know, like one of the genes he studied made the seeds of the pea plant be wrinkled rather than smooth. So the thing about these single genes is that they're necessary and sufficient. So if you were a pea plant, your seeds would only be wrinkled if you had a copy of that mutation, the wrinkled seed mutation from your mother and your father. It's recessive. We can go into that later if you want. But it's, that's how it's necessary to have the gene, and it's sufficient. If you've got the two, two copies of that mutation, you will have wrinkled seeds. 
And there are thousands of single gene disorders in humans, many of them with neurological sorts of implications because the brain is so complex, it's likely to be affected by a lot of things like this. And so that's how people learn about genes. And, and, and if you take like Huntington's disease, which Woody Guthrie died from, and his son Arlo Guthrie then had a 50% chance of having this disorder. So the thing about it is it is a single gene and it means it's necessary and sufficient. So um, if Arlo Guthrie got that, it's a dominant disorder as well. So you only need one copy. So he, only, he has a 50-50 chance of getting that gene from his father, Woody Guthrie. If he had the gene, if he had that mutation, he would then have a 50% chance of developing the disorder and he will die from Huntington's. I mean, until we figure out something to ameliorate it, usually to uh, stop its onset. You know, once people have the disorder, so much is deteriorated in the brain, it's hard to do much about it. But the thing is, all the stuff we study, all the common medical disorders as well, like heart disease and cancer and everything, it's not like that. There's genetic influence, but it's not one gene. It's thousands of little genetic effects. So many, many genes each have little effects. It doesn't make it any less, it, well, it does make it less genetic. It's probably the reason why it's not 100% heritable. I mean, Huntington's disease, for example, single gene disorders are 100% heritable, meaning inherited DNA is entirely responsible for the differences we see in whether people have Huntington's or not. But with human traits, psychological yeah. traits, we're talking about 50% of the variance. But it's even more amazing then that you're not talking about this one gene carrying through development and then having the effect, but we're talking about genetic propensities, you know, thousands of genes. And so this comes back to the point you were making. These are propensities, but they're not deterministic and hardwired like a single gene. So in fact, you can do something about it. And I find that by recognizing the genetics, it can actually help you to deal with it. I mean, it doesn't mean you were a bad person. It doesn't mean that your parents messed you up early in life. I mean, maybe they did, but it does, you know, if you're if you take that point of view you describe where it's all environmental, it's very easy with Freudian influence to turn that back into early childhood. And, you know, you go to a lot of counselors and they'll do that. The first thing they'll talk about is your relationship with your parents early in life, as if that determines everything. And it actually determines very little. Now, there are severe cases, certainly, but um, there are severe cases of single genes as well. So I think it is important for people to recognize genetics is important. And then you can go forward from that and, and make positive changes in your life by recognizing who you are genetically as well. And so the best example for me is this obesity. We can now actually create these DNA scores that tell you about your genetic risk. And for height and weight, these predictions are actually very good. And my highest risk score is for obesity. And that was really uh, important for me because, you know, I don't, you don't wake up one day obese. It's just a few pounds every year and they just don't go away. And it's harder for you to lose weight. You try to exercise, you try to control your eating. But for some people, it's just a lot harder to keep the pounds off. In, in a fast food yeah. nation, when we evolved um, in the Stone Age, our brains are Stone Age, but we're living where we didn't know when the next meal would come. So it's actually many of the genes involved in being fat are good genes evolutionarily. It meant you could store fat. When you don't know when your next meal is coming, that's a good thing. But in a fast food world, you know, it's a bad thing because it's just you can't resist those cues and you tend to eat more. So for me and many other people, they find it very motivating because I realize, you know, okay, I've got a battle here. And you roll up your sleeves and you say, it's not just that I'm weak-willed or something. It's just harder for me. So I change my environment. I don't have snacks around. And in the last year and a half, I've taken semi-glutides and 10% of my body weight gone, you know? And then the second wow. I, st I stopped, you know about the semi-glutide story, you know? Um, Ozempic. No, I'm, I'm not familiar. Okay, Ozempic. Oh, Ozempic, sure, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ozempic so, is part of that drug class, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. Okay. It's sort of the one most people use. And it's just been amazing to me. And it's a, it really supports the biological argument because if I stop taking it, I can... You know, you might think, well, once you have a new set point, you might 
stay there. But no, same sort of thing. You know, you gradually go back. There was a study 18 months after people had lost 10% of their body weight. And it turns out in a year, they probably gained 5 50% of that again. You know, they're halfway back to where they were if they don't take it anymore. But all of that just suggests to me that there really is a biological component to this. And where people mess, mix this up is they say, well, how can that be? If you if I lock you in your room and you don't have food, you lose weight. But I hope people can see that that's irrelevant. We're talking about living yeah. in the world with the environmental variation that's there. And unfortunately, in some ways, the variation in accessibility to food is amazing. You know, so... Um, so it's not deterministic. It's probabilistic. And that's probably one of the bigger messages to get across to people. It's a very important one, because I think if someone is just reading some of these statistics for the first time, it's very easy for their first interpretation to be, oh, well, that's just, you know, I don't have free will in this decision. I'm clearly not bound to be an athlete. I'm clearly not bound to be smart. But that's actually not like upon further investigation, if you dissect it further, it's really that we just have natural gifts for things and we're not naturally gifted to do other things. And that doesn't necessarily mean we can't fight uphill and become yeah. pretty good at anything, really. I mean, there's a lot of examples of you know, child prodigies in sport who hated the sport. Andre Agassi is one of a huge tennis fan. Who he, he like his dad just basically created that vision for him and made him play tennis for ten hours a day. Um, and he yeah, hated yeah. his life and was very depressed. Do you, do you know at this moment we are missing the men's single semi final in Wimbledon? <laughs> you don't have to remind me. Carlos Alcaraz and Daniel Medvedev. There's not oh, many yeah. guests that I would be missing that match for. I'm a huge okay. tennis fan. Well, I've been glued to it all the time. Who are you betting on? Oh, Alcaraz. Every day of the week, good. he's my favorite. I mean, Bar I, yeah. I live my in Barcelona for one, so I have to support the Spanish. Uh, yeah, he's the best. He's incredible. I could, I could, I could waste another 90 minutes talking about Carlos Alcaraz, <laughs> but I don't think that's <laughs> why our listeners... Yeah, um, I think he's just amazing. He's incredible. He's incredible. His attitude and his level of humbleness, everything. Anyway, my, my point was that I am, you know, I get Andre Agassi, for people who don't know, is a good case. He was the, one, the number one tennis player in the world for a number of years. And his dad basically decided at the age of three that he was going to be the best tennis player in the world. And he had to fight uphill at every point and hated his, you know, he became depressed. He was a drug addict. He was num ranked number one in the world and addicted to methamphetamines. You know, it was a crazy story. It means that there's nothing that's purely deterministic here. We can go up, up upstream. We can do things that were and uh, maybe not genetically have a huge propensity for. It just means that we are good at some stuff and we're not good. And that's an important realization yeah. to have. But, you know, a, a corollary of what you're saying is that it might make sense to realize that there are these genetic differences. And it, doesn't it make more sense to go with the genetic flow than fighting against it? It's not to say, just as your example with Agassi, you know, it's not to say you can get pretty far without it. Now, I bet you if we tested Agassi, you know, we had genes for, for, from him. I bet you'd find that he had, you know, he, he's very athletic. I mean, his reactions are good and his speed is good. I mean, he has a lot of raw material there. And if someone had, you know, no raw material, it would be very hard to do that. I, you're, you're objecting to it, but let me just I throw actually, one. I, I actually don't know if I agree with that. I think tennis, tennis is one of those sports that I actually think you can drill into someone with 100 hours a week. I that's my, like you don't need a the, the, an interesting argument, but you don't need a huge VO2 max. You don't need a particular density. I think of different muscle fibers. I think it's mostly pattern recognition and reflexes, which are trained. Maybe. But we don't that's, know. That, that would be my question. But you know, you you see it where, I mean, you know, most ridiculous. If you want your son to be a, a basketball star and he's five foot two, it's going to be tough, right? Yeah. But I mean, on yes, other that's levels, a good where the VO max is important, like the running, you know, the speed and that sort of thing. So I think in most sports, it probably makes a difference. But, you know, I just thinking when you were talking, Paulini, you know, who's going to be in the women's semi, uh, in the women's final, right? Surprisingly, yeah. she's what, five foot four or something like that. And, you know, she's this yeah. little butterball in a way. I mean, you look at her and you say, there is no sportswoman there. But, you know, she's really yeah. got what you're talking about, you know. And so that's an interesting question. Maybe the, tennis is less due to genetic 
influence. I think so. You, Cause you get the greatest variability in body structures, forms. Dude. I mean, Diego Schwartzman is was five foot four and Goffin is also like five foot five. These guys are tiny, but there's also benefits to that in sport. Cause they're close to the, I've also been a tennis coach for 10 years. I should oh, also mention wow. that. So wow. I've, I've, I've coached clients for 10 years. So I know like the being closer to the ground, you just have such control over your ground strokes. Your center of gravity is so low. So it's just one of those sports that I think is naturally a, a bit more trainable and patterns. And there's a lot of yeah. cases of people like Stefano Sitsipas, who's just clearly had hundreds of thousands of euro worth of coaching for 20 years with the best facilities and everything. And I think yeah. he was as close to now he's also six foot four and all of that yeah. as well. But, you know, tennis is, I think, is a good example. But that's, that, yeah, that, that's a great, I am, um, I think, place to so, sorry, go ahead, Joanna. Yeah, just one more thing to add to that, though, to make sure people understand, we're not saying that I would argue that to be the best in the field, you really need to have the, gen the genetic goods to some extent. You know, otherwise the uphill battle is too much uphill, makes, makes it unlikely yeah. to do it. But you don't want to take from that that you can't improve. I mean, you can have, you can be tone deaf and you can become a very good musician. Do you know? You, it's just, but you're never going to be probably making a living from it. But, you know, who cares? I mean, a lot of what music's about is just enjoying it. And same thing with athletics. You don't have to be so competitive and think you're going to be the best in the world. You can just go out because you like being in nature and you like running and all of that. You know, so it, we're not saying that genetic influence, you know, limits you in any way other than I would say being the very best. You, you know, it's sure yeah. a lot easier if you've got the genetic goods. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's true. I think the next, that was a great opener. I think people have a very good idea of the different studies that people, that, that researchers and scientists have used to figure out the relationships between genes and behavior. I think a good next logical place would be to go is, is how do genes impact behavior? Right. Well, um, the nice thing about the designs we've talked about is you don't have to know the answer to that question. We're just saying we've got inherited yes. DNA differences, and now we can actually measure them through sequencing DNA. And then we say those differences relate to traits that we're interested in. And so we don't have to know the, um, the way in which DNA is transcribed and translated into, you know, RNA and amino acid sequences and then affect the brain. And that's what, you know, people in your field, neuroscience are particularly interested in doing. And a lot of science is um, reductionistic and causal in that sense. The problem is that even for single gene disorders, like one of the first discovered in 1935, phenylketonuria, PKU, which causes 1% of institutionalized mentally disabled children, we still don't really know how that works because it isn't like one simple hardwired thing in the brain, you know? So if, if it's so difficult finding out how one gene mutation works in the brain to do something like cause mental retardation, then what are the chances if there are thousands and thousands of little effects that we're going to be able to trace gene to brain to behavior pathways? But that's what we'd like to do. That's what lots of people are doing and more power to them. But as a psychologist, I'm interested in being able to predict behavior from DNA, inherited genes. And so it's the difference between prediction and explanation. And you know, it, it sounds unscientific to say that I'm, more, I'm much more interested in prediction than explanation because, you know, 99% of science is about trying to explain. So to be clear, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying for me, what's interesting here is we don't need to know about epigenetics or even the brain. We can just say, I want to predict who's going to be schizophrenic. And I can do that with DNA from a cheek swab. There's, and there's a lot yeah. you can do with that studying it developmentally, how it interacts with the environment. And the big thing now is how it interacts with treatments. Instead of one size fits all treatment, the thing in all fields of medicine and psychology people are doing is saying, maybe we can predict which treatment is more likely to work for you based on your genetics. So what are some of the key predictions that we've been able to make from behavioral genetics that we haven't touched on already? Well, the one we just touched on is the what we call the nature of nurture. And I mean, we were talking about television and divorce. But we now know that almost most of the environmental measures that we use in psychology and call environmental 
show substantial genetic influence, not 50%, but on average 25%. And that's important because my blood pressure always goes up when you read in the newspaper, you know, scare stories for parents. You got to do this or your child's going to be screwed up for life. The evidence base is very weak, but no one ever says the key question. I hope your audience will say, but what about genetics? You know, parents and children share genes with their kids. So parents who read a lot to their kids, you know, a correlation between how much parents read to their kids and how well they do in reading at school. It, it, you know, if you're not thinking about it, it just seems obvious that that correlation, and that's all it is, is a correlation, is so easily interpreted environmentally and causally. Yeah, sure, the parents read a lot, so they make their kids better at reading. But then, you know, cue the question, what about genetics? Parents and children are 50% similar genetically. What parents read a lot to their children? What children like to be read a lot by their parents? Do you know? I mean, I have six grandchildren, and a couple of them, you know, it'd almost be abuse if I made them sit there and read, which is what I thought grandchildren are supposed to do. I mean, they want me to read to them. No, they want to go out and kick a ball around. You know, they don't want me to sit there and read to them. So I think the genetics comes in that parents differ in how much they value reading, how many books they have in their house. There's genetic influence on those things. And children differ genetically too. And parents and offspring share 50% of their genes. So parents who are interested in reading have kids who do well in reading. So there's thousands of examples like that. So it's very important to recognize, to, to come up with the what about genetics question when you see these correlations between environment and outcome. So the, the nature of nurture is one thing. And a, another, there are, I have a paper called 10 major, ten, top 10 replicated findings in behavioral genetics. And um, we won't go through them all, but uh, um, I'll just mention I'd two It's more. very entertaining. Well, one, one's genetic and one's environmental, but I'll stick with the environment for now. Um, so this other finding is called non-shared environment. And we've gone from thinking that the way the environment works is nurture, that is, it's due to your family environment, to realizing that if heritability is 50%, that means environmental differences are responsible for 50%. But the 50% environmental influence is not the environment of Freud and nurture. It's not what your parents did. It's something else. And this is completely yeah. true for like personality and psychopathology. So as easy as it is to uh, pin these things on your parents, it's important to recognize that the environment works to make two children in the same family as different as children in other families. And that's called non-shared environment. It's not the environment shared by parents, uh, by children growing up in the family, as reasonable as it is to think that's the case. And so if you put these two findings together, that genetics accounts for about 50% of the differences between people, and that the environment is not nurture, it's this non-shared environment that makes kids in the family growing up together. You put them together and you come up with an extraordinary prediction. And that is that if you had been, 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 been a state mistake in the maternity ward and the wrong parents took you home, what I'm saying is that you would be very much the same person that you are today. Because it's a crazy statement. you're genetically identical. It's a crazy statement. And it yeah. seems it seems crazy, except that there's data. You take identical twins really yeah. apart. And they're almost as similar as identical twins reared together. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's a, that one really blew my mind. That one, when I when I read that for the first time, it took me a while to internalize it. I had to put the book down and just walk around a bit because <laughs> it, it's just one of those things. I mean, I'm sure it's an idea that you're so used to and you've seen so much data in support of, and it's something that you've lectured on and talked about so much that it's a normal idea for for you. But I think it's it's just such an overwhelmingly mind boggling idea. Well, to a lot of other people that were that yeah. genetically determined. Well, great. I'm glad you felt that way in a way. In psychology, we need more <laughs> findings like that. You know, there, there, there's a criticism that a lot of what we do is discover what your grandmother always knew. And, you know, and um, so it's really good. I, I'm, you know, as I look back at my career, I'm just, I like these big findings, you know, that really, you know, have a lot of far reaching implications and it's important for parenting, you know, so I'm glad you appreciated that. Let's, let's try. I've one, um, I've one counter to, to this as a possible idea. I'd love to, so, so this, this data is well replicated in very large studies, 
but I, I presume that's or or how much does it vary between say I know you were in charge of some very large twin and adoption studies in the UK. Um, has there been much data in other cultures in completely different countries with similar sizes of twins, males, females, everything? How how much does the data replicate cross culture? Yeah, well, you know, it's a very good question, and I'd like to introduce it by pointing out another misunderstanding about genetics. So we're studying, say, if you take weight, say, if I in my twin study in England, I'm talking about individual differences as they exist in England today, genetically and environmentally. We're describing what is. We're not saying what could be. So we can find 70% heritability for weight, which surprises a lot of people. If you look around at the differences in in weight in people, it's very easy to say, well, you you know, he's a blob because he doesn't exercise and he eats like a pig. But you gotta recognize that the majority of the differences between people are due to genetics in a probabilistic way, right? And so the point of that is we're describing what is, but not saying what could be. I mean, you can get ridiculous of what could be. You could lock me in a room, not give me food, I lose weight. Fine, that's that's okay. But then the question you're asking is more um, profound, and that is, what about different cultures? You know, you could find different results. Because just like means and variances are descriptive statistics, a mean, a height, mean height in one country, you go to another country, it has a different distribution of height, you expect a different mean. You want your descriptive statistics to describe the population you're studying. So it could well be yeah. that in other cultures you get different results, and that doesn't nullify the results in England at all. You know, I want to study what's going on in England. But when we do these studies, and the studies that have been done most are like height, weight, um, uh, cognitive ability to some extent, you, f- you do find similar results. So for IQ, for example, you find, you know, heritability of IQ is maybe 50%. And, um, you, f- you know, you thought, we thought early on, if you, if you went to societies that were much more uh, culturally restrictive, say like the Soviet Union in, in the old days, where, you know, you ex- might expect environmental variation to be less, you'd expect less heritability. But in general, what we find in Southeast Asia and in Eastern Europe, and in a study I find very fascinating, in rural India, where most people are illiterate versus urban India, you find the same sort of result. Now, that didn't have to be... It's crazy. It doesn't make the results, you know, it doesn't improve the, the it, it's not adding to the validity of the data. They, they definitely could have been different, but it's quite fascinating that they are about the same in most countries, despite great environmental differences. So it's a good question, but in general, we find similar results. Even when countries differ a lot, like you take height, for example, and height in Japan, where people are a lot shorter than in America or the Netherlands, same heritability, you know, Wow. Of heights, say, for example. It's very interesting. And a really interesting study when Japanese people came to America after the Second World War, in one generation, their offspring were two inches taller. Wow. But, I didn't know that. That's but interesting. The heritability was just the same. So this makes the same, a third yeah. point, and that is that the causes of individual differences, which is what we're studying, are not necessarily related to the causes of mean differences. So the mean Japanese offspring height could increase greatly. That can't be genetic in one generation. But the individual differences are still just as heritable. So yes. that would be the cultural effect too. You know, it'd be no it's no surprise that there are mean differences between populations or even secular changes, you know, in, in one society. You know, we're talking about what is with a particular snapshot of a population with its mix of genetics and environment. If you change the genetics, say through emigration or immigration, or you change the environment, you know, like making school universal, for example, you could well change the genetic and environmental balance. So we're describing what is rather than predicting what could be. And they're both valid questions, just that we've got some really solid data and methods to address what is, and what could be, you know, could be speculative until you do the studies that show that 
it works. The, the fact that it replicates between rural India and the UK is really quite astounding. I mean, it just shows the robustness of that data and that there really is very solid foundations in it, no matter yeah. how unintuitive or against our in, in initial preconception it is. Yeah. Do, do, these heritage, to... do the heritability in these... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to ask um, a separate question about the, do, does the heritability in these traits differ between males and females? No. And it's just whenever people describe a difference, it never replicates. And it's very interesting. I mean, the one study I published that didn't replicate was trying to say that the heritability of some personality trait was stronger for males and females. There's some reason to think from biological developmental work that boys follow the genetic blueprint to a greater extent than girls. But anytime anyone ever reports it, it never replicates. And that's especially astounding when you look at things with huge sex differences, like the biggest sex differences in terms of psychopathology are for these early childhood disorders like autism and ADHD, both of which are much worse in boys than girls. And so you'd mm -hmm. expect to find genetic differences. But first, you're probably thinking of the X and Y chromosome. You know, girls are XX and boys are XY. Not much to that. And then it's, it's, you know, you just can't find genes that differ, that it's the same genes that are affecting boys and girls. So I don't know much about it, but the way I think about it, it's just that there's one gene that determines whether you're a boy or a girl, you know, basically early in development. But that triggers a cascade of hormonal changes, including brain changes. And so the way I think about it is maybe the same genes are affecting, say, cognitive ability in boys and girls, but it's just they have different effects in these boy brains and girl brains. But it's a good question. But um, yep. So I think it's safe to say that we uh, hardly ever find differences other than at the single gene level, because if there's a lot of disorders are on the X chromosome and because girls have two X chromosomes, it, they're a mutation on one is masks. But if boys get that mutation on their X chromosome, the Y is a tiny chromosome that doesn't compensate. So that's why a yeah. lot of sex uh, linked disorders on the X chromosome are more prevalent in boys than in girls. But that's, again, a single gene. Yeah. Thing. And we're not talking about single genes here. Is there any disparity between female and male twins? Like, are there more? Is there any differences there? Or are they ex exactly the same yeah. in Great prevalence? Question. Because the neat thing about the uh, twin method uh, is the comparability of identical and paternal twins. But, of course, identical twins are always the same sex, except for a few, you know, one in a million cases where there was some mutation early in the, in the embryological development. You know, but they're the same sex. So what about fraternal twins? Well, they're 50% same sex and 50% different sex because, you know, it's just a probability thing. It's like boys and, you know, the chances of having a boy or a girl, 50-50. So having two girls, two boys. So... Um, it's a better experiment if you compare same-sex identical twins, always same sex, to the same-sex fraternal twins. But then what about yeah. the opposite sex fraternal twins? Well, they get at exactly what you're talking about. You can say if there's genetic differences between boys and girls, you would predict that the opposite sex fraternal twins are less similar than the same sex fraternal twins. They both are 50% yeah. similar genetically, but if there's different genes affecting boys and girls, you'd expect that correlation to be lower for opposite sex twins, and you don't find that. So that's another piece of evidence. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It's kind of funny how nature sort of by random accident gave us twins, and yeah. just by nature of how twins work, it's we've been able to conclude loads of things about nature yeah. just by the set of variables that twins kind of allow. Yes, yeah, it is a real gift. Another another really interesting thing that blew me away in the book was that our, we become more similar to our DNA over time. So yeah. like this this is this is clearly like against intuition. Like how how could this be right? We go through life, all of these events hit us. We do all of these things. We work hard at things. We change our identity based on life experiences, or we think they're based on life experiences. Yes, are we become more similar to our twins, even if we're reared apart? We become more close to our to our DNA. Can you can you explain this a bit? Yeah. Well, just to underline the puzzling aspect of this, if it doesn't puzzle people, is B. F. Skinner, who's this famous environmentalist in America, learning psychologist. You know, he, his whole life is spent showing the environment is important, but in the sense of 
you can control things, you can change things. But that's a can what you can do versus what is question. But later in life, he wrote a book on aging. He lived to about 90 or something like that. And in that book on aging, he said, the older I get, the more I become who I am. The older I get, the more I become who I am. That could, should kind of sink in for people because I guarantee you, as you grow up and get old, you'll, you'll see that. You, you know, I had a striking experience once where I've had a beard for 40 years or 50 years. And one holiday, I decided to shave it off. And I looked in the mirror and I said, oh my God, there's my father. The older, the older, the more, you know, my face kind of got leaner and more like his as I move, moved from a young man to a, an older man. But you'll see that in terms yeah. of personality, too. You'll begin to recognize some things you don't like about your parents. Like my father became, it was quick tempered, you know, and it's not pleasant to see in people. You know, they fly into a rage about something. And, you know, I find I have a tendency towards that. And again, it's it's good. It helps me because I recognize okay, I got to cool it, you know, just before you let yourself go, you just say, wait a minute now, I suffer more than anyone when I, I become really angry. I don't get over it quickly, you know. So I think it is important to recognize that um, genetics becomes more important as we get older. And as you're saying, if people, if I ask people, does heritability increase or decrease, they won't know what I'm talking about. But if I explain to yeah. them, well, do you think environmental factors become more important as you go through life. And a lot of people would say yes, but it's because they misunderstand how genes work. They think genes only have an effect at birth, at conception, you know, and then after that, it's just like they're hanging out there and it's the environment that makes a difference. But based on all that we've said, yeah. you, you see that it, that the inherited DNA differences make a difference later in life. Like schizophrenia, you don't really see anything in kids who have a high genetic propensity to schizophrenia until their brain passes adolescence when the brain is mature enough to be able to have hallucinations and delusions and you know create false realities for themselves so genes do change during development and and increase and especially for cognitive abilities this is the strongest finding that the heritability of cognitive ability like most people say IQ general cognitive ability as well as specific cognitive abilities goes up linearly throughout development from, say, 20% of the variance in infancy, 40% in childhood, 60% in mid-adulthood. And then some people say even higher later in life at 80, if you exclude dementia, which is its own thing, you know, but of course lowers cognitive ability a lot. So that's really amazing because we're not talking about tiny effects here. We're, again, psychology rarely explains 5% of the variance. Well, we're starting off at 20%. With infancy, but then yeah. by childhood in the early school years, forty percent, then sixty percent, then eighty percent, and the next question always is, but what? Why is that? And the answer is nobody knows. But most people believe it has to do with what we're talking about earlier. It isn't that genes are hard hardwired and make you know, say like vocabulary is the most highly heritable cognitive test, but that doesn't mean that those words are somehow you know, imprinted in your brain. It's not hardwired. What it has to do is if you see kids who are verbal, like one of my grandchildren is just verbally very good. She always wants to know about nuances of word. Why do you use that word than this word, you know? And, you know, she's going to, she's got a great vocabulary, even at eight or whatever, and she's going to have a much better vocabulary because she's just tuned into that channel. And that's the way genes work. Yeah. It's they, they, you know, just give you little nudges. It's it's sort of what you like to do. You like to learn about that. It may have been music or athletics, but with her, it's this verbal channel. And then my two of my other grandchildren, you know, it's like, whatever, you know what I mean, which is also a reasonable response. I mean, communication is just about me understanding them. You know, it doesn't have to be this subtle, yeah. sophisticated sort of thing. So it's interesting that for cognitive abilities, that the heritability increases linearly, and that's a well-established finding. For a lot of other things, it doesn't change that much. But where it changes, where heritability changes, it tends to go up in development. And the reason that's interesting is because if people understood what you're talking about, they might say, well, of course, environmental differences make more of a difference because, you know, the genes are what you get at birth. And then after that, accidents, illnesses, parents, school, friends, everything else, you know, come 
accrues really, it accumulates during your life. So it's not unreasonable to expect that environmental differences become more important, which would mean that genetic differences relatively become less important. But again, it's just interesting to know that doesn't seem to be true. And I think these surprising findings are really cool, you know, where people sit up and say, hmm, I didn't know that. They absolutely are. They're very interesting. The, the, the specific example that you have in the book where if twins that are reared apart, they do an IQ test at, you know, younger in adolescence, they're more likely to diverge. But as they both go on their separate lives, and it doesn't matter if one of them is in the North Pole and the other one is in the South Pole, and their experiences couldn't be more different, I am their IQs tend to converge. And if they take a test at 60, they'll be more similar than they were at 15. That's pretty astounding. It's very strange. I yeah. know you said we don't know why, but mm -hmm. I, love to, I love to even take off the scientist's hat for a while and speculate, because this is a, an informal podcast. I'd love to even get your intuition. Do you think that evolutionarily that's a bug, a feature, or an accident? No, I think it's definitely a feature. I think it's along the lines of what we were okay. talking about, where the environment isn't just things like accidents and illnesses that happen to us. Most of the environment in psychology that affects us psychologically is experience. And that has to do with this selecting, modifying, even creating environments correlated with our genetic propensities. So you really see that for cognitive ability. You know, people who are interested in reading and thinking and talking and understanding, they create their environments. They have their friends, their spouse, they read, they, you know, they, they just foster their genetic propensity. So that my parents, who died a few years ago, they were in this old people's home where there were a lot of very bright people around and they weren't lobotomized sitting in front of the television. They were at this place because there were people who were interesting and wanted to talk about things, you know? And so I, that was a question of selecting an environment. So, you know, selecting an old people's home where people were, you know, engaged and so I think you see it, see it throughout life, and I certainly see it in my grandchildren. I could have predicted which of them were going to go on academically from a very early age just by their, the way they interacted with their environment. You know, I also studied these super bright kids early in life, and that's eye-opening. If you've ever seen either, say, a musically talent, you know, I hear what you were saying about you don't necessarily need talent, especially for tennis. But like with music, you do see some kids who very early on, they can you know, you play Absolutely. a melody, they can just sing it back to you, you know, it's not just perfect pitch and stuff like that. You know, so I think um, when you see these really bright kids, it, it isn't sort of the environment, it's not like they have tutors who give them calculus at the age of eight or something. If they go into a room and they ask questions like, have you ever noticed that the corners are at these angles? You know, and you say, what? But you know, it's there's questioning it, everything. They're using the yeah. same environment very differently, and I think teachers see that a yeah. lot. You can't stand in front of thirty kids and realize some of them are really they're so far ahead of you. You know, you just got to stay out of their way. And the others, it's like you got to really work and work and work to get them up to some minimal levels of literacy and numeracy. Yeah, it reminds me of I remember reading a hypothesis. Now I don't think there's any data for this specifically related to why the prefrontal cortex develops later than the rest of the brain. Mm. And I remember reading that one of the hypotheses for that is so that people are a little less bounded in their adventurousness. You know, like in adolescence is when you're most likely to create a political party or have a coup against an opposing government or become a professional mm. athlete or become a professional musician. It allows for outliers to some extent, because one of the things that the prefrontal cortex does is it kind of creates boundary constraints ac across us. And that's why people are a lot more, you know, tending to do outlier like activities in their younger age. I wonder, is this somewhat more somewhat related to that as well, that having maybe being slightly more um, departed from your genetic blueprint in the earlier years allows you for more exploration and more adventurousness. And then as time goes on, you really want to be a bit more consolidated. You want to, you know, consolidated on your, your thinking, your moral beliefs, what you are good at, what you're not good at, your thinking, just everything. As you age, you want to be more, you know, predictable, I guess. That's best for your, your safety, best for your success. I, again, there's no data for this, but I'm curious, are those two related or is there any link between, between that yeah. as well? Well, I know the general uh, question you're asking is about, the, about evolution. And 
I think it's a good time to bring up the idea that a lot of evolutionary theory is what we call normative. It's talking about the human species. Like you said, the prefrontal cortex develops later for these adaptive reasons. That's normative. It's not about individual differences. And you could have something yeah. that's highly, you know, if, if something's evolutionarily important, people say, oh, well, then it's got to be genetic. But no, because this is the difference between means and variance again. The normative approach is saying, why are humans the way they are? But we're asking about why are humans different? And so there's no necessary relationship between the genetics of individual differences and the genetics of normative development. And a really um, way of underlining this is of the 3 billion base pairs of DNA, you know, base pair, the, a step in the spiral staircase of the double helix of DNA. So of those 3 billion steps, you know, you and I and everyone are similar, at least 99.8% or something like that. You know, so most of those bases, if we sequence your DNA and mine, be all the same. But we're still talking about millions of DNA differences when you've got 3 billion of these base pairs. And so with the, the 3 billion base pairs that are similar among all of us is what makes us human. But it's that 0.1% of the DNA that differs that makes us different. And so it's, it's again, interesting yeah. to think that, you know, it's just a very small portion of all our DNA that differs, but that's responsible for all these differences we see. And evolutionarily, you could argue that DNA variation is money in the bank for evolution. Because one way evolution goes is, you know, they you can be bred very specifically for this one environment where you don't allow any variation because any variation is bad because you perfectly suited to this environment. But then what happens if the environment changes? You're screwed as a species. So species yeah. that are evolved to handle different environments will generally have more DNA variation that, you know, it, it has to be held within limits a little too much and, you know, it's, it's maladaptive. But on average, you know, that variability is like money in the bank for changing environments evolutionarily. And that's what humans are especially good at. Yeah. You, you mentioned something earlier that I, I didn't, that I, a connection that I hadn't made either was that the, the heritability of something like weight could have been a very important yeah. environmental evolutionary factor. That also hadn't occurred to me. Is there anything about a high heritability of a trait? Does that tell us anything else about how important that trait is, maybe an evolutionary past? Or is there any other information that we can derive from the heritability of our trait? Anything interesting from that? Yeah, we can derive a lot of interest from heritability, but not about evolution. So, I mean, the main point I was yeah. trying to make there is that a, a, a trait that's highly adaptive, like you might think um, language in humans, you know, it kind of makes sense that man's a natural language user. I know it's complicated arguments and stuff, but in general, we learn language very easily compared to apes, for example, or chimps. But that doesn't mean that individual differences in language development are heritable. You know, they could, that because the variation is not related to the means. So these are two very different questions. So it is important to say that the, the definitive answer to your question about what is this heritage, what does heritability tell us about um, uh, evolutionarily, evolutionary adaptiveness, say? The answer is nothing, necessarily, you know? So yeah. that's important. But otherwise, what we get out of heritability, uh, there are a lot of issues, like the interface with the environment, now molecular genetics. You know, it, um, heritability is like the basis for these traits. And we can go beyond heritability of traits, this is probably the biggest advance, to study the covariation between traits. And what we find is that the genetics of one cognitive ability overlap a lot with the genetics of another cognitive ability. It isn't as if, you know, like what you might think, spatial ability and memory are both highly heritable. But you might think from a neuro point of view that there's many different genes involved, you know, in the memory processes and the spatial process. But actually, what this genetic data, this is like cross heritability, you know, it's covariance rather than variance. And so we're saying, what we find is that most of the genes that affect spatial ability are the same genes that affect memory ability. And another example of this, that's even, uh, is especially important, is to do with the two big forms of psychosis are schizophrenia, and bipolar manic depression. Can we assume that people know basically what those are? 
and up until the, yes, I was going to say maybe to give a a, a quick okay, yeah. a quick it's overview on the on the yeah. sort of thought disorders where you lose touch with reality and it, there are different types of paranoia and skits and um, I, they call it hebephrenic where it's more emotional but basically it's losing touch with reality and it's a thought disorder sort of thing whereas bipolar manic depression yeah. like Stephen Fry you know is an advocate for this um, disorder where it the it's depression people know depression but it's cycles of depression and bipolar and mania and the the, the mania makes you feel crazier than the depression because you know it's where you'll spend out your credit cards you'll you know be it'd be like on a cocaine high for several days you know and so that's bipolar manic depression well up until the recent diagnostic statistic manual 5 you couldn't be schizophrenic and bipolar that was the first division in um uh the structure of psychiatric disorders. But then when we did the first, what they're called genome-wide association studies to find the genes for these disorders, and this is in 2000, late 2000s, 2007 and 2010, the genes that come up for schizophrenia as most related to schizophrenia, the same genes come up for bipolar. And now what we know is that instead of these disorders being genetically different, about the correlation between them genetically is on the order of 0.6. They're highly correlated genetically. And so yeah. that's, that means that etiologically, they're not these distinct disorders, even though they look very different. You know, and all of our work is mostly at that phenotypic level. But at this first causal level of genetics, they don't look like they're different disorders. And then, more generally, most psychiatric disorders have many genes in common. They correlate genetically. Yeah. And that's really important then and to realize that there's kind of a general genetic disposition towards psychopathology, but it's less a matter of one specific disorder or another. So that's really big. This is just in the last few years. So this that's another a huge, a huge point. Out of these studies. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, and I have, this was a really interesting point that I also picked up in the book. I have a quote from Blueprint that I think really well summarizes what you just said, which is what we call disorders are merely the extremes of the same genes that work throughout the normal distribution. That is, there are no genes for any psychological disorder. I had to reread this a couple of times and it is worth restating. There are no genes for any psychological disorder. Instead, we all have many of the DNA differences that are related to those disorders. The salient question is how many of these we have. I think this is another very powerful idea that does not have very much penetration in the general population. This is not really, I think, the mental model that people have for psychopathology. You know, they have some, like autism clearly means there's a distinct difference in the brain. There's one difference and you either have it or you don't. And you yeah. can say that about every about every psychopathology. Talk talk about that a bit more because I think it's incredibly important. Well, the bumper sticker for this chapter in the book, Blueprint, is the abnormal is normal. That is, the differences, as yeah. you just said in that quote, is they're quantitative, not qualitative. They're a matter of more or less rather than either or. But because of the medical model where you either have COVID or you don't. And we say, if you have the SARS virus, you've got COVID. So that's going back to like single genes and single causes of things, which you know is a lot of what medical progress has been about. But we're not, it's, it's not relevant to these common disorders, whether they're medical, cardiovascular, or whatever, or psychiatric. The, well, now that we found genes that predict risk for, say, schizophrenia. It's not that they're people that it's not at all even bimodal, let alone, um, you know, uh, ideologically completely distinct. The, if you look at the genes that affect schizophrenia and you assign people scores on the basis of how many of those risk factors they have genetically, called a polygenic score, a multiple gene score, where we're adding up the effects of thousands of single gene little single gene effects, you find that that distribution is perfectly normal. That is, there's no breakpoint 
at which people become schizophrenic. It's just quantitative. It's a matter of more or less. And the reason that goes, it's difficult for people to get their head around is we sort of want to think about those schizophrenics and us normal people. But we don't don't yeah. realize we all have thousands of genetic risk factors for schizophrenia. It's just if you have 10,000 of the risk factors, you're more likely to be schizophrenic. But even then, it doesn't mean that you will be schizophrenic. It's probabilistic. And people have trouble yeah. with that, partly because of that single gene thing, you know, where we all learn about genetics. But it is such an important point. It's different from the point we were just making about the genetic correlation between traits. But this is probably yeah. an even more important point for people to realize that the abnormal is normal in the sense that it's it's a normal distribution of risk. It isn't um, qualitative, but rather quantitative. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up. That's so, a good point. I, I think it's a good one to talk about for a while, just again, just because it, it's so important in today's world. And again, just not a thing that I think is very penetrative in society. We don't talk about psychopathologies in this way. So much so that it seems like we have this huge misalignment between the system we have for diagnosing people, our diagnostic system, which is fundamentally qualitative. You know, you have this marker or you don't. You have the label. You don't have the label. I think it's almost like, like just a problem we have with language in general that it doesn't work here. But how do we get closer to aligning this quantitative idea of how genes contribute towards outside of the normal distribution, behavioral phenotypes and then diagnostics? Like, yeah. How do we connect those two so that we're able to appropriately diagnose people? And if they need help, get that help. Yeah. So first, I'd like to say that I'm not saying there aren't behavioral problems. There, there is. Uh, you know, people like in my area of uh, learning disabilities, some kids have trouble learning to read. But what I would ask is, what do we gain from pretending that there's a disorder a disability, a dis reading disability, to medicalize it even more, give it a Greek or a Latin name, call it dyslexia. So it yeah. sounds like, oh, my child has dyslexia. So that explains everything. It doesn't explain anything. Kids differ in how yeah. easily they learn to read. And some kids have a lot of problems learning to read. I'm not denying that there's the reading problem. I'm just asking, what do we gain by saying, by diagnosing them and saying they have it and the rest don't? No, there's a lot of kids who have reading problems just as bad as the kid who was diagnosed, you know. So it's thinking exactly. about it quantitatively has to help us. But it also has the downside, especially nowadays, I find, everyone wants to have a disorder. I had a, I had a friend who called me, a 50-year-old guy, who was like all excited because he says, God, I figured out why my life is fucked up. I was, di <laughs> I was just diagnosed as ADHD. And, and that oh, explains okay. everything, you know. And yeah. I had to tell him, you know, that really doesn't explain anything. You're just a jerk, you know, and you, you, you're not nice to people. It's, 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 but, you know, that's why they like a diagnosis because they say, that's it. Now I understand myself. Yeah. But it's just so Agency wrong. thrown away. Not my yeah. fault. It's not my yeah. fault. Yeah. And with ADHD, they're, yeah, kids have, they differ in attention. They differ in how active they are. If they had the hyperactivity ADHD a diagnosis when I was a kid, I definitely would have had it. Because in those days, in the Catholic school system in Chicago, we were stuck in these train track chairs that are, you know, in a row, like in a train. And, you know, you don't move during the day. You know, if you're squirming around or you're getting bored or whatever, you know, that's what makes you ADHD. But I do think getting out in the real world, a lot of ADHD characteristics are quite positive, you know, like the yeah. attentional problems. You take an ADHD kid and get them involved in a video game or something they're really keen on, they don't have an attention problem. They have a boredom problem yeah. like, more than anything. And similarly with hyperactivity, being active in a sense of energy has to be a very big factor in success in life. So, so anyway, I think I can see why people like the diagnosis idea. They like it for their kids because you got that label and, okay, that's why my kid's not good at school. He's dyslexic. You know, but it's it's a it's a false comfort, also in understanding ourselves. It tricks, 
yeah, it tricks the world, I think, because when you when you're a parent and you're you know you or you get the diagnosis that your child has dyslexia, it kind of tricks the, you into what that actually means. Because I don't think people f- really fully understand what that means. It's it's a label, so it, it has power as being a label. But I think yes. people into like understand that label as having a lot more power than than it do, it is. Like they they'll look at their child in a slightly different way when. There's, there's nothing different there. It's just, again, a slightly outside of the normal distribution of what reading ability would be like. And I don't think that people understand that, really. They see dyslexia. They see that label. As you say, it's a scientific word. It's a medical diagnosis. There's something wrong with that person. I am, so it's like a fundamental different way of thinking about it, I think. Yeah. And I think the other part of it is that it's, it, because it's part of the medical model, it's like a single, you think there's going to be some single cause. So if we could just find out what bit of the brain is wrong with my reading disabled child, we could f- maybe fix that or maybe give them a drug that will fix this biochemical pathway. And so it's, exactly. it's, it's kind of wicked in that sense too. And I would just say, no, you got to roll up your sleeves. We have one of our grandchildren was born with uh, anoxia and, you know, had neural problems early in life, had trouble reading, but we didn't just say, oh, well, dyslexic, you know, there it is. Let's yeah. hope that neuroscience comes up with something. No, you know, we all put in a lot of work to get him to read. And he reads, you know, reasonably well now. He reads for enjoyment, which is the the big divide, you know. Because if you have trouble reading, you're not likely to read. But now nowadays with Audible, for example, you know, reading uh, books that are read aloud to you. Um, and a lot of the computer, the software that makes it uh, possible for people who have real trouble reading to be able to read, you know, to hear things. So um, it, that's, those are aspects of, it's not just a conceptual issue of diagnoses versus dimensions. It has a lot of real world implications for, for labeling ourselves and, and for doing things about it rather than just saying, oh, well, there's the disorder, dyslexia, you know? So I, I'm glad you yeah. brought this up. I think it is a, a, a point that I do find it's easy to, this is easier than some of the other things we talked about to get people to understand it. For sure, for sure. But it still doesn't solve the issue on how... If you were to make a change now to how we were diagnosing things, and I know you're not a medical doctor, but again, I'm, yeah. I'm curious with your de- in-depth understanding of, of yeah. how these things present themselves. How would you make a diagnostic change to the medical system yeah. today? Well, absolutely. It was done. when DSM-5, the latest diagnostic statistical manual of psychiatry, they because they're aware of these sorts of data, they said, why don't we shadow our diagnoses with quantitative trait measures? You know, like with depression, instead of the diagnosis would say, you got to be uh, depressed for two weeks and you need to have a eating problem or, a, so, you know, and then you, you just say you need two of those or three of those. And, but then you end up with one number. What if yeah. instead we just got quantitative assessments of all of those things? the symptoms, and then say, how do they cohere in a syndrome? But if all you collect is zeros and ones, that is, diagnosed case or not, you don't go anywhere. Because my argument is, scientifically, it's just got to make more sense. Do it quantitatively. You can do your qualitative then at the end. But you can also see to what extent that qualitative diagnosis is merited, but even better, you can study it at the level of those symptoms, because very often we find that these things we call syndromes aren't really syndromes. They're just a bunch of symptoms. Like you mentioned autism. And there's the best example. Yeah. It, up, yeah. It, there's now a dyad, but it used to be a triad. There were three things that Canner said in 1945 is what you need to be autistic. He saw some kids who had communication problems and um, this repetitive motor movement things and um, sort of social interaction problems. They now combine the social and the communication versus, they call it repetitive. It's, it's, it's really like, you know, the Rain Man, Dustin Hoffman movie with needing things yeah. exactly, you're very compulsive. If you don't put the slippers exactly the same way at the end of the bed, the kid won't sleep, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So systematizing, the is, yeah. These are actually not genetically related. Schizophrenia and bipolar are genetically more related to each other than these components of autism. There's just really that's something I did. That's not something really I didn't syndrome. know. But what it is is, if you have one of those problems, the compulsiveness, say, 
you know, that makes you a bit odd as a child. And then if you have one of the other problems, like communication problem, where they can't look you in the eye, you know, that's the kind of classical sort of symptom. Because, and, and even babies, some babies, you know, really, they they turn their heads so that, you know, it's too intense or something if you're looking right, making eye contact, you know? So if you have one problem, that's bad. You have two problems, that's worse. And you have three problems, that's even worse. So kids who have all three problems, yeah. they look they look pretty bad. But that doesn't mean that those things go together. It could just be a statistical yeah. artifact of, yeah, some kids who have one, by chance, also have the other. It doesn't make it a syndrome. And genetically, that seems yeah. to be the case, that these components of autism are, are not part of a syndrome. And again, it's not yeah. to say these aren't problems. They are problems. But again, I just ask, what's to be gained by pretending that it's this ideologically distinct diagnosis? My kid has autism. End of story, you know? Yeah. So uh, I, mean, get, I get on the soapbox a bit about this, but it's just like Alice in Wonderland. I just, when when are we going to get it, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it, it, is, it is tough. It is challenging. Do you, like... Because what I heard originally is that you would contextualize a, like a, a psychopathology by breaking it up into some features and then rank ordering, say, a child on each of those different features. Now, of course, you have the difficulty of knowing do these features really all actually mean the same thing? Do they all fit under the same psychopathology? But then at least if you were able to, to rank order all of those different behavioral symptoms, get some quantitative power behind it, you could then have a score of some sort, which is just much more nuanced than a single label, right? Then you might be able to better characterize the, the care or the therapy that they would be able to get if that's what they're, what it's, if that's what they need. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree with that, but you could also study the symptoms themselves and say a lot of times, you know, it's at that more uh, basic level, you know, it, you were saying, well, you could order them and put them together more empirically say, but maybe, we don't need to put things together. The, that there does seem to be a general psychopathology, and that will involve just about any symptoms you want to talk about. That there's a general genetic risk towards. They actually call it little p, p as in psychopathology, like a general disposition towards psychopathology. And what we've been doing recently in our research is taking that out of the specific disorders. So. It, it, when mm. you, right now, when you study autism, ADHD, schizophrenia, bipolar, any of 20 other disorders, a large part of what you're studying is the same thing because the same genes yeah. are involved. So wouldn't it make sense? Another if, point if, worth, if, sorry, just, just as I, that's just one point I think is incredibly salient. And again, something that people don't really appreciate fully is that there is a huge overlap in these gene clusters you talk about in the book that contribute to a very large amount of what we'll call labels for different psychopathologies, but the underlying genetics is actually quite similar. That's a quite a weird, a weird idea it and is, quite strange yeah. because, especially for something like schizophrenia, which is you know people associate with hallucinations, like they're called positive hallucinations, but nothing about them is emotionally positive. Seeing things and hearing voices in your head and and all of these things, like a lot of people put schizophrenia in a very different boat to, you know, anxiety or major depression sure. disorders. You know, those are seen as quite separate, but really they have quite a lot of the same genetic underpinnings. I just don't, another idea that I think is not very well known in the general population. Yeah. And then what I'm talking about is going beyond that to say, it's not all general, but, you know, the genetic correlations are the big surprise, but you could actually take out what's general in order to study what's truly specific. So instead of just looking at yeah. ADHD, autism, these other disorders, where you're mostly studying the same thing, a genetics is a lot of what gives you the systematic findings in these areas, developmentally and all of that. But you could take out the general factor and then study what is specific. And, you know, and then that, that's got to be better than just glomming it yeah. all together. In, in each of these disorders. So that's one major direction for research now is the spec really focusing on the specificity by taking out the generality. And we're also doing that with cognitive abilities, the same thing there. The reason P is called P, little P, is because it comes, it's an analogous to G. I don't know if people have heard about G, is little G is general cognitive ability, intelligence, IQ. So the same thing, I was alluding to this before, that the genes that affect memory 
are very substantially the same genes that affect spatial ability, verbal ability, and everything. Despite, you know, that's from a neuro point of view, that's pretty weird because you expect the processes, the neural processes to be so different. But in fact, the genetics is, overlaps tremendously. So what we're doing is the same sort of thing I just described. To really study individual differences in memory, you need to take out this G, general factor. Otherwise, yeah. you're, you think you're studying memory or spatial ability, but you're largely studying the same general cognitive ability. So take that out. Yeah. And then look at specificity. So I think that's an exciting area of research. That makes a lot of sense to me. Do, do you think that the, the future of genetics, that the gold standard for this sort of diag diagnostics would be that, you know, we have very well isolated the, the general um, underlying genes that contribute to all of the different um, pathologies. And then we have sets of genes, and it still could be thousands, that do always contribute to a particular condition. And we have because of some advancement in some high fidelity genetic um, you know, technology that allows for an exact mapping of, of g specific genes to labels of conditions. Do you think that that's possible? Do you think that that is this type of genetic technology that people are trying to develop? Yeah, sure. That's what people want to do. I think I, 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 I'm not optimistic about the second point about finding the specific genes if there are thousands of genes involved. Yeah. But... Um, what's what's happening now is uh, this has completely transformed medicine because all of medicine now is moving from a model where you know you're you're trying to fix problems that have occurred like a heart attack to predicting and preventing. So and DNA is the best early warning system we have. So in the UK now there's a a, a project called um, Our Future Health that involves five million people giving their DNA. And in, in the England, we have this National Health Service, so we have good electronic records of everything. Um, this has been brilliant in Scandinavia for a while, but now in the UK, we're finally trying to take advantage of this so that you can currently predict who's going to have a heart attack, you know, probabilistically. It's maybe, you know, it's not 100%, yeah. but, you know, you if you were told you had a tenfold and 5% of males walking around in England are in this category, you have a tenfold greater risk of having a severe heart attack in midlife. You know, we're not talking about in old age. You would probably pay attention to that. You know, you would probably do what we're all supposed to do, eat well, sleep well, exercise, etc. But then you can go beyond those low-tech solutions to say, um, you know, you can do these body scans. You can detect early on, early signs of problems. And prevention, you know, um, Benjamin Franklin was right, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And it's got to be true as well. If you can prevent a heart attack, it's said that it can save the NHS 700,000 pounds all in. Because you, know, you have a heart attack, there's a lot of medical care involved in that. You know, the, the economic cost is great, but how about personal cost? You know, so it's just a no-brainer yeah. that if you can predict and prevent, that's got to be better than waiting till people end up in the hospital and then trying to fix it because, you know, you can never fix it completely. And that's true of a lot of disorders. It's even thought to be what we need to be doing for schizophrenia and psychoses is to try to prevent these things from happening. Because it is known that if your first episode of schizophrenia is ameliorated, that is, it's made less severe one way or another by catching it early, uh, by drugs or whatever, it makes your um, likelihood of fewer and less severe recurrences greater. So that's the area we're in. Ah, we're not looking for, I didn't know that. We're not looking for the cause of these things, but we're just trying to prevent them or slow down their uh, occurrence. And that's the thinking with dementia too. You're not going to, you're not, once dementia has occurred, you know, once people have Alzheimer's, you don't need a microscope when you look at their brain to see something seriously wrong here, you know, a post-mortem brain. Um, so it's got to be a matter of trying to slow the development of the disorder. You know, it's said that if we all lived long enough, we'd all have dementia. It's just kind of miraculous yeah. in a way that we go so far beyond our reproductive age. And the evolution yeah. has done such a good job that we can't, we still are able to function much later in life. So prevention yeah. rather than cure is the way medicine is going. 
And because I, we have the same problems, I think about that in t- that same sort of model in terms of uh, psychology, prevention rather than cure. Absolutely. Do you know of any, are, are there any tests on the market today that you have any endorsement for or that you think are generally good to do? I did a 23andMe um, a couple of years ago, just out of my own interest. Uh-huh. And I can't say I've gotten anything particularly groundbreaking from it. I know that I yes. have one of the genes that predisposes me to, to Alzheimer's disease when I'm 80, but it's only a very small, very small risk factor. I am, I know, I think I have 80% or more Neanderthal DNA than 80% of the population. I'm not sure what to do with that one. I am, yeah. I don't contain the gene that makes my urine smell like green vegetables. Again, not sure what I'm fully supposed to take away from yeah. that one. I yeah. am, I don't have any of the schizophrenic ones. I find a third cousin in the USA every now and again from by, by email, yeah. but I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, like, yeah, I like it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Like it, it's, fun. it's interesting. I'm just, I... you had two of those alleles, two of those genes for Alzheimer's. Yeah. That's only 1% of the population, but they go up to like a 60, 70% risk of having Alzheimer's later in life. So the reason 27 million people have done 23 and me and these similar things, it paid, I don't know how much you paid, but you know, 150 bucks, something like that. And a lot yeah. of people do it for the ancestry, which is kind of interesting in itself. It's the same DNA information that you can use to develop uh, ancestry. And people in America, especially, are often surprised by, you know, everyone in America thinks they're Irish and they're actually not. Yeah. And they find out, yeah. most of us find out we're mongrels, you know, from Eastern Europe. Of great annoyance to everyone in Ireland that you meet, in, you meet a person from America and they, they think they're 100% Irish. It's like our number one, yeah, it's number one ick for any Irish person is that is the first thing any American person says. But my, ser- my serious I did point find out that I'm 99.9% is- Irish. Yeah, my, um, <laughs> my serious point about what you said before though, about not finding much interest there, I think one thing people ought to say is, Whew, that's good news because we could tell yes, for sure exactly. if you had these single gene mutations. Now, the second bit of it is that if you're most of these single gene disorders are recessive. So you need a copy from your mother and your father before you have the disorder. But if you have one copy, you're a carrier. Carriers often for most of these disorders show no effect. So you would get that result yeah. and it would say, okay, no effect for you. But where this is real big and I think could have a huge impact on society is that you know, when you want to get married in the States, you have to have a test for sexually transmitted diseases. But you could then, even though these 7,000 disorders are very rare, carriers are very common. And that's how they survive in evolutionarily, because you don't show it if you have one copy. And okay, if you have two copies, then, you know, then that's bad news. And that person might not reproduce or whatever. But the point of this is that if couples screened for these mutations, we all carry four or five, you know, really bad news mutations, but they're usually recessive. But then you have some probability, some people say as high as 1%, that you and your prospective mate might have the same rare, you might be carriers for the same genetic disease. And if you knew that then, and everybody everybody did this, you could actually eliminate these single gene recessive disorders, which are the biggest cause of medical genetic problems, you know, full stop. And it's just horrible. I mean, if you had a kid with Tay-Sachs disease, they're going to die a horrible death in the first few years of life, for example. So, you know, it, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I know. I know an example of this in Ireland is that Ireland has a particular high, p- particularly high uh, rate of prevalence in the cystic fibrosis gene. So I believe it's one in nineteen uh, people in Ireland hold the recessive gene for cystic fibrosis, which means what you have a one in three hundred and seventy-five, say odd, um, percent ch- uh, chance of also mating with someone else who has that recessive fibrosis gene if yeah. you're in Ireland, and that's a very deadly, very deadly illness. Yeah. I am, and that's a particularly high, particularly high prevalence in Ireland. I remember learning that in, in college. Yeah, well, that's interesting. The most uh, illustrious case of this is Tay-Sachs disease, which is particularly prevalent. It's a, it's a recessive disorder, particularly prevalent in Ashkenazi Jews. And because in, say, New York, um, a lot of marriages are arranged in the Hasidic community, um, you know, the very traditional Ashkenazi Jewish community, that they very early on, like 20 years ago, realized that Tay-Sachs uh, can be detected 
because it's a single gene disorder. And so they, they started adding to that to their list of things you check when you um, uh, intend to marry someone. And they pretty much eliminated Tay-Sachs. And so if you found out so that your mate let, had let this... Let me question this. Do they, sorry, do they eliminate the gene by choosing a different partner? Or is there a genetic technology that actually can go in to the gene and, and yeah. fix whatever issue is there? Yeah. Um, the way that's done and the way this would be useful in Ireland, I didn't know it was that prevalence was that high, but it's probably high enough that it would be worth people in Ireland thinking about this. Because if you found out that you were a carrier for cystic fibrosis and your mate was a carrier, what you, I mean, you could decide if it was early in your mating career, well, plenty of fish in the sea and you try someone else, but you Amazing could, career. May, maybe you, uh, instead though, you could say, some par people say they will adopt, but the option most uh -huh. people take is the medical option of in vitro fertilization. So that, you know, normally when you go through in vitro, and people don't often do this until they have a child, say, who's cystic fibrosis. And then you say, oops, we're carriers for this disorder because we don't have cystic fibrosis, but we have a kid who does. But you only have a yeah. one out of four chance of having a kid who has cystic fibrosis. You know, it's just straight probability, right? So yeah. a lot of people won't find out that way. And when they do, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very tough way of diagnosing whether you're a carrier. So instead, if we actually did the genetic test and found out that you're both carriers, then you have the option of saying that you could um, do in vitro fertilization where they typically have eight to 12 embryos that they create, you know, in a test tube. These are test tube babies where you take the sperm and the mother's egg and you put them together and create this zygote. And then you let it develop to a few stages. And then you take the ones in the past that just sort of looked healthier. But now what you can do is you can genotype those embryos and one quarter of them will have two copies. And no matter how you feel about it ethically, if I if you knew that and I at the doctor said, which embryos would you like me to implant? Would you like me to implant this one with two copies of the cystic fibrosis gene? You know, duh. Yeah. No. It's, and so that's no what question. you do yeah. is the screen for that. Now that also adds to a lot of problems because with that DNA then you can determine a lot of other things, height, hair color, and what people really worry about, intelligence. So what about that? But at least at the medical level, you go in for a specific reason, like you're a carrier for cystic fibrosis, they would do this, but they would get all the information. You, you know, you'd get all the DNA information, but you'd only be looking at this one about cystic fibrosis because that's why you went there, you know, to find out about that. And so then... Yeah. So that is a medical solution to this. Then, you know, you would put in an embryo that has zero chance. You might even put it an embryo and one quarter of them will have no cystic fibrosis alleles. So you might even say, well, put those yeah. in. And so that's that's a solution. Now, um, in vitro fertilization, people worry about with designer babies and everything. Having had a kid who's gone through this, it's not a fun thing to do. I mean, the woman has to be put on hormonal yeah. programs and it's not something people would do on a lark for sure. And it's expensive, you know, in the UK, yeah. maybe 10, 15,000 pounds a throw. So, it, you know, it's, it's not nothing, but that is a real solution. And the point, the general point backing up here is that um, this is a way, you know, you take these tests and you end up saying, well, you don't have anything really dangerous or bad. First, you should say, great. But then second, you might want to think about whether you're a carrier for some of these disorders. And then third, you can, there are co companies that will allow you to download your genotypes from 23andMe and upload them on a company's website where they will give you polygenic scores. 23andMe, oh, I, I don't know when you did it, but if you did it in the last few years, the only polygenic score you'd get would be for body mass index. You would know where you're... I can't you're... even remember if I have a BMI score there. I did it probably three years ago now. Um, I don't remember any polygenic score under. there. Now, they could give you thousands, hundreds of polygenic scores for all sorts of things. Yeah. But they don't because 23andMe was shut down for a couple of years because they had initially marketed themselves, what, 15, 20 years ago as entertainment. You know, find out about your ancestry, find out if you've got the, 
you you know what your pee smells like after eating asparagus or you know these weird sort of curling your tongue yeah that sort of stuff but then they were also giving you information on breast cancer and on alzheimer's and it turns out yeah that these are no surprise but it, these are very accurately genotyped and so you're getting medical grade information about whether you're at risk for alzheimer's or whether a woman has Angelina Jolie, BRCA1 and 2, those genes, you know, that create early onset, very severe breast cancer. So they had to yeah. go back to the drawing board and resurrect themselves as providing real medical information. They still give you all these quirky little things. But having been so burned by the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, um, to have to shut down for two years, they're reluctant to give people important polygenic score information. Because, you know, it's tough enough to get people to understand risk at the single gene level. But, you know, at the polygenic level, the p probabilistic thing, you know, you'd have to go through the same spiel that I gave. But there are companies now that allow you to, um, it's not easy, but with 23andMe, you can download all your genotypic information. It's not that big a file. I actually didn't know that. That's very interesting. I'm going to go look and, and try that because I didn't even know that was possible. You know, it's, you probably want that information. It's not sequence. It's just uh, just six hundred thousand single. They call it single nucleotide polymorphism SNPs. These steps in yeah. the spiral staircase because they're spread out throughout the genome, but they also have an excess of the single genes mutations that are important. So it's pro it's worthwhile information to have, and it's yours. And why not have it? But then there's all these these yeah. other companies that would allow you then with easily with the push of a button to transfer that information and they will create polygenic scores. The problem is that they're no good, that they're just sort of wanting big data. They want your genotype data because numbers is gotcha. what it's all about, right? But there there is there was a company, Impute Me, that was particularly good. It was just a, a altruistic uh, researcher in Finland who just realized this gap and provided the information for people in an unbelievably good way. He uh, deleted the data after he provided your results. He just wanted to make this available to people. But then lawsuits came about because people were getting data and they, you know, said it ruined their lives or, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a tricky business, right? And it, and it's very new, new industry, and lots of, lots of data. Yeah. So yeah, he's actually it's just a whole a new thing, in, a company in New York that is just coming up and i've just blocked on the name i mean it's genomics but it's um it's not neurogenomics it's genomics something i'm sorry but uh his, i can look it up after and then i'll link it well, in the i'll link it in the, the description the for people to take a look Finnish, the director of the company is this finnish guy lasse l-a-s-s-e folker folkerson f-o-l-k-e-r-s-e-n so he's not too hard to find and it's got the word genomics in it and they're great and but like a lot of other companies, they're particularly interested in offering um, whole sequence, whole genome sequence data. But they, they will I'll definitely take a look at that. Yeah, because that's the thing now is instead of 600,000 base pairs, you can now for a few hundred dollars, really, it, you know, a genome sequence, the whole genome of three billion base pairs. And that's going to change everything because that's the end of the story. That's all you inherit are those 3 billion base pairs of DNA. And so any mutation... Have you done one of these? Yeah, I have. Not with this current company because they're just starting up, but I've done it with um, uh, another company. I, last count, I figured there's about 70 such DNA companies around the world called direct-to-consumer, DTC companies. And yeah. a lot of them are, are, are not good. There's no, no regulation. It's a wild west. Yeah. And a lot of them are just really trying to get people's data. And they're overselling. For some reason in Southeast Asia, this is huge. It's like the go-to shower gift for your baby. Yeah. Do the genotyping. Yeah. You can do it of an infant, of a newborn, you know? And then, then they pretend to be able to give you uh, parenting information specifically directed towards the type of child you have genetically. And that's way overselling what we've got, you know, wh where we are at now. And I don't know why yeah. that's, it's, it's huge in China, even in mainland China, with Chinese companies that you can't access from outside of China. But it, Singapore is a kind of the hub for this sort of stuff. And 
you know, it's, it's, it, it, there's a lot of good that can come from it, you know, but it's, in a way, it, it needs regulation. And if I were in those companies, I'd want regulation so that, you know, eventually it's going to come back and bite them, you know, that um, people can't trust the data they're getting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's an emerging field. And the I do have a set of questions on the, emer the, the you know, the future of genetics, because there's so much to ask there. I wanted to ask one more question there. So there, there isn't a current technology that exists today where I can get my genome sequenced, I can pinpoint an SMP, a single nucleotide polymorphism that I don't want and have it deleted, have it pointedly. There isn't a genetic therapy that does that today. Is that correct? No, I mean, that's what gene editing is about. And that's the hottest area. Yeah. So if you have a single gene disorder, the idea is you can go in and change the gene. But even for cystic fibrosis, you know, which, you know, people were keen on that. They gene editing, the first few cases died. There, there's, you know, it's a, such a complex system, even if it's a single gene effect, there's a lot of unintended consequences of changing things like that. But the biggest problem is that with cystic fibrosis, the problem's in the lung, and you could put in good genes in the lung that compensate for the bad genes, because you have access to okay. the lung, it tissues easy. But what about psychology? You don't have access to the brain. And the thing is, if you could change something, you could gene edit at the moment, instead of in vitro fertilization, before that, you could change the genes in the sperm or the egg or the zygote at a one cell level. But soon you have trillions of cells. You can't change the genes in all of those cells. So unless you can yeah. change the ancestral gene. So that's why I'm not very optimistic about it, except for areas like um, sickle cell anemia, maybe cystic fibrosis, where you have access to the relevant tissue. And if you could change the stem cells, say, in the case of um, the blood um, thalassemias, that, that might work. But I think it's more likely that you would deal with this at the level of uh, in vitro fertilization. And a lot of these okay. bad mutations are what they call de novo. They just appear, you know, when you've got 3 billion base pairs, even though DNA replication is very accurate, you know, one mistake in 100 million means you've got a lot of mistakes. And so they're de novo. You haven't inherited them. You created themselves somewhere developmentally. And if they occurred early, then they would be in many of your cells and they could cause problems. But with that, then, I don't know where gene editing is going to work because you won't find out about it until later. And then how are you going to change hundreds of thousands or millions of cells, like neurons, for example? So gene editing is a very big thing. It has definitely has a, a function. But if you go online, you get these companies talking about pharmaceutical sorts of interventions with gene editing. And, you know, that's that's ridiculous. You're not going to change your facial configuration, you know, genetically. I mean, you know, there's Botox yeah. and those sorts of things, but that's a very different thing. So gene editing is a big thing, but uh, I, I, for complex disorders, I just don't see how that's going to work. We'd probably need a fundamentally groundbreaking technology, so, something that is just outside the realm of what we have today, maybe tackling a completely different mechanism or ta tackling a mechanism that we don't even know exists today. But, you know, who, who's to know what the next three decades Absolutely. looks like in genetics? And never you know say what? never, especially in such a fast moving field. Yeah. Yeah. And where AI is going to play into genetics is also yes. just, is also just a, a, is, is a whole other area. Yes. I am um, one area that I wanted to talk, that I wanted to touch on. It's funnily enough, probably even more controversial than what we've just been talking about. There's another quote in the book, um, which is parents matter, but they don't make a difference. <laughs> let's, That's let's, let's, let's talk wrong, through this. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's so many other interesting topics. That, that's gotten more attention, those four pages or whatever they are, seven pages maybe, than the rest of the book in the popular press. So much so that I actually got a contract to, from Penguin to write a, a book on that topic. Because I do think parenting yeah. you know, is, is really where a lot of this stuff has its impact, you know, genetics. And so I, I did start to write it, but then my great editor made it clear to me that the level you have to write for a parenting book is not a level I can write at. You know, yeah. I mean, you really got to get down with the diapers and all of that. And, you know, Blueprint, I thought, was about as far as I could go. And a lot of people do find it a difficult book. I mean, it's not your airplane page turner sort of book. 
But yeah. so I decided I couldn't do it. Now, the re- if you That's understand, I'd love to read that book. Yeah. Well, I heard someone else was doing it, and then that also helped me decide not to do it. But then turns out the book they wrote was no good anyway. So I don't know. Anyway, um, you you know, at my age, I want to do things I like to do, and I came to realize. I love doing blueprint because it's kind of a summary of 50 years of research that I've done and other people in the field. But I, you know, parenting book, I didn't get that vibe. It was a struggle for six months. And then I eventually had to give back a very large advance, which isn't something that's fun to do you know, <laughs> in advance for the book. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, lot to say about that, but if, if people understand the title that you just said, parents matter, but they don't make a difference. And so that's sort yeah. of the issue of means and variances. So the don't make a difference. That means don't make kids different. That is the nurture yeah. thing really doesn't have much of an effect empirically. You know, what, what matters is genetics and parents provide the genetics, but also parents matter in the nomothetic sense that we're talking about. You know, that our species can't develop by itself. It's neotenous and, you know, it needs a caregiver. So parents definitely matter, you know, whether you're there to support the child or not, but you don't, how much support you provide doesn't make a difference. You know, you need some evolutionarily expected average level of care, but beyond that, it doesn't make much of a difference. And that's important for parents to realize that their kid isn't this fragile thing that, you know, that, that, that bugs me, these parenting books and media, they really take advantage of parents who are anxious about things to say, to give them that idea that, you know, if, if you one false step and your kid's screwed up for life, well, kids aren't, they're very resilient. And I think, you know, evolution was, was good on that score. It's very dangerous that we're so slow to develop. We need caregivers, parents matter, caregivers matter. Our species don't develop by themselves, but, but it's within, it's evolutionarily good enough environments. Sandra Scar used to call it good enough parenting. It doesn't have to be perfect parenting. It has to be, you know, provide the basics that kids need. And that includes love and support, you know. So um, so parents matter. I, I definitely don't want to say they don't matter, but they don't make a difference nearly as much as we thought. And so these are two, it's a double whammy for parents because First of all, they often don't recognize until later how much effect their genetics has on the kid. Yeah. So that's the nature side. But then they assume that, well, they they provide the nurture, but they don't really. The way the environment works is this non-shared environment. So they don't have much control over that. And so in a way, put these together and it says parents need to relax a bit more. They don't have nearly as much control as they think they have. Now, that doesn't mean you throw your hands up and say, oh, well, can't do anything. Just let the little bugger develop the way he develops, you know. It's not that at all. It's that a parent is not like it's not a factory producing good little citizens. It's a relationship. And like with your spouse, if if you have a relationship and I said, well, she's pretty good, but I can shape her up. You know, I can make her into a more interesting, intelligent person or whatever. I mean, that's a disaster. Right. But that's what we do with our kids. And what we should be doing is love them and support them and um, not think that we are going to shape them to be what we want them or think that they should be. And so I think the message yeah. here is that parents need to take love their children and support them and do things for them because you love them, not because you want them to be what you want them to be. And part of that is finding out what they like to do so that you go with the flow more. Just, you know, I agree with what you said before. doesn't mean they can't do something that they're not particularly good at, but why not find out what they're good at? And it's a virtuous cycle. They, they'll do it more and they'll like it more and they'll get better and better at it. But it's because you found out what they like to do rather than assuming that they will, you know, they'll, that you can mold them to be what you want them to be. So you, and yeah. the other side of it is you don't have as much control as you think anyway. So you might as well face that and just love them and enjoy them. And I think stand back and watch them become who they are. You know, and that's an important message because, you know, when you have more than one kid, you see how different they are. And 
that's an amazing part of uh, parenting is to see them become who they are rather than thinking you're yeah. going to make them into what you want them to be. And it's what you do with other relationships. And this is the longest relationship you'll have in life with your kid. So, you know, I think a lot There's... of these parenting books really are are dangerous in telling parents, you must do this, you must do that. And then it's counterproductive yeah. to, to enjoying the relationship. I mean, so many young parents who spend their life trying not to get pregnant, and then it's so hard to get pregnant later in life when they want to. And it's just, you know, it's it's um, it seems like such a waste to see them anxious all the time about everything. And instead, they should relax and enjoy it is more than they do. Yeah. Yeah, no, I can. I, there's nothing that you said there that I that I disagree with. Um, the thing that I Im immediately popped into my head when I read that is, you know, ev everyone's been on an, on an airplane and they see parents there with their screaming child, and mm -hmm. in that moment, me having never had children, not have hoping to have children in a couple of years, but not not at the moment, is my judgmental self where I'm saying if those parents would just discipline that child properly, that child is going to grow up to be you know, going to have tantrums, going to have mood issues, going to be entitled. They're just kicking and screaming and the parent doesn't do anything about it, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the issues that always irritate me. And I that's always sweet. go through my mind and I think that's the parent's fault. You know, they need to be properly telling that child that's not a correct way to behave. Yeah. I want to be clear and I don't want to misrepresent what you mean. Do you think yeah. that the, the, the parent intervening in that moment or not over a number of years will have practically no impact on how that child grows up and who they become to be. Well, first I'd say that I'm not saying parents shouldn't do anything. You you shouldn't I mean if you shouldn't let a kid be a brat like that and be out of control because it's not good for them. So, you know, part yeah. of loving them is saying you can't do it. It doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean you don't it's completely hands off. You don't if your kid your your one child is hitting the other child over the head, you don't just say, oh, well, I can't do anything about that. You can change behavior, but you're not going to change. You're not going to make a difference in personality. So you can stop your kid from being, you know, annoying everybody or, you know, crying, you know, shouting or, you know, being outrageous. But that's because you're trying to control that behavior in that situation. And it's your job as a parent to do that. And you can also do it because you love them. You know, you know, it's not good for them either. You know, because it's not going to be good for their relationships with people if they can't control themselves emotionally. But don't think that you're making a difference for psychopathology, personality, or cognitive ability. You don't make a difference in these psychological traits, but you certainly can control behavior. A good example is in England uh, 10 years ago. So there's a big push against bullying in schools. And you know, you can definitely control the bullying, you, bullying, you know, kids get reported for bullying and people take it seriously and they sit the kids down and talk about it. And you can really reduce bullying. But are you reducing bullies? Once you're outside that control of the school, out, you know, in the, the streets later, I think the bullies are still bullies. And maybe you've learned to deal with it better, you know, not being bullied or whatever. But you so you can control the behaviors. But you don't want to assume that you're then getting rid of bullying in life. I mean, it's got to be better than yeah. at least control it in one situation. But, you know, there's still bullies out there, as we see on the Internet. My God, that brings out all the bullies in the world, doesn't it? So I yeah. think uh, just to emphasize the point you make, which is a really good one, when that kid's screaming on an airplane, you should look at those parents and say, you know, come on, get it together. you child shouldn't be doing that. You should recognize that some parents have a harder time. Some kids are just emotionally more labile or whatever. So it's going to be harder for some parents than others. But they should, they certainly should just be letting Johnny run up and down the aisle screaming and all of that. That's something that there's no excuse for. I mean, if a child's freaked out and crying, there's only so much you can do. But you want to see the parents doing that. You don't want to you see parents saying, oh, that's Johnny, just that's the way he is, you know. So yeah, I think it is a very important point that you make there. So do you think because because so do you think that if if the parents do control that behavior, say from age zero all the way up to four or five, say at every single incidence that that parent stops the the child from acting inappropriately, 
compared to a ver- another scenario where they don't and the child is just let run rampant they they're screaming they're taking control of everything the parents really do not influence that situation at all do you think that kid by the time they reach 18 is any different in those two scenarios in their personality in their psychopathology uh, across any of those dimensions I don't think in their intrinsic sort of personality and psychopathology, perhaps in their control. So it's just like me and my father. My father, you know, has this quick temper and um, gets angry, you know, really easily and it stays angry for a while. So I've learned that that's just not good for me. And so I control that. But it, I still, if I had let I allow myself, I still could get easily angered at things. I've controlled myself so much that I don't a lot, you know, I don't often get to that point. You know, I recognize the signs before and I deal with it. So I don't think I've changed my uh, emotional lability fundamentally. I've learned how to deal with it. Isn't it the same as like with obesity, you know? I still have the genetic propensity for putting on weight. If it wasn't for Ozempic, I, you know, I would be back, you know, those, those 11 kilos would be right back. Uh, well, right within a few months, you know. So I've controlled my um, uh, weight, but I haven't changed my genetic propensity. And the, probably the best example yeah. is alcoholism. You know, there's a fairly strong genetic component for alcoholism. And But if you don't drink alcohol, you're not going to be alcoholic. And I know several kids of alcoholic parents who won't touch alcohol just because that you can't become alcoholic unless you drink a lot of alcohol over a long period of time. And they don't want to go yeah. there because they saw how awful it is. So they haven't changed their genetic propensity, right? But they've changed their behavior. And, you know, that's good enough, I think. So, yeah, it's a good general point you're making. And I haven't really talked about that at that more general level. But it is a good point that you change the behavior. But that doesn't mean you're changing the genetic propensity. Yeah. It's challenging because the reason I the reason I think about it is, you know, I think about parenting a lot. I think it's a fascination with neuroscience and development. I mean, what could be more interesting in, in raising a child? And there's one trait that I want to be very sure that my children don't have. It's the number one thing that irritates me more than anything is entitlement. And yeah. it's the only thing that I would I would actually be. I would be, and I always talk about it with my girlfriend that I would just, it would be so upsetting to us if our children grew up entitled. You know, we want them to be grateful people. Do you think parents, because especially with something like entitlement, it seems like that's, you know, in, in my intuition is that's, that's nurture, right? That's how they're taught to deal with gratitude of things and to be entitled with their material possessions or to be happy that they have them. Or, and, and that seems to be nurture-based. Do you think that we, would, we have control over a trait like entitlement? If you, I don't know if you'd consider that a trait, yeah. but you know, entitlement as, as how you define it. Like, do we, can parents control that? Well, that's such a complex type uh, topic, entitlement, because it's it's sort of attitudinal. And if you grew up in a very wealthy family, you, you know, you expect servants to just have your clothes out and, and, you know, you don't think about these things. And so you would say, if this person then went out in the real world, they'd be acting in an entitled way. But really, they're just acting on the basis of their world as they experienced it. But what you're talking about is lack of gratitude or whatever. So maybe a simpler topic to start with is kindness. I always felt that's the most important thing for my kids. And it's not unrelated to what you're talking about. But I think being kind mm-hmm. is really important. And a kid who is aggressive, antisocial, going to find it harder to be kind. They're not like naturally kind, right? But they still can learn to be kind. It's the same sort of thing we were talking about. You know, that if it's very important for me as a parent and I see my aggressive kid being aggressive, I say, well, no, that's that's not cool. You you really have to be kind. You have to be nice to people. And if you need to be selfish about it, you can say what goes around comes around and it's probably better for you, too. But, you know, it's just an important value for me. So as your parent, you know, I, I do want you not to do those things and to do these things. So you, you definitely can make a difference. But I don't think I'd be taking my aggressive child and making them less aggressive, again, it would just be, they not just, they would learn to deal with it. They would say, yeah, I have this aggressive tendency, and that's not cool. It's better to be nice to people. And so you could get them, I think, to do that. So you're changing their behavior, but I don't think you're changing 
their their natural tendencies. And so entitlement, though, is a, a higher abstract level sort of thing. I know what you mean, and it bugs me too. It's why I don't take graduate students from Oxbridge, Cambridge and Oxford, because a lot of them silver spoon yeah. in their and they have the sense of entitlement. Yeah. And I want kids, I, I, I want kids, I want graduate students who have been out in the world and the best ones are ones where they've done stuff in business, they've made money, and then they say, that, that isn't what life's about, just making money. They want to do something more meaningful. So that's the yeah. type of student I really like, um, sort of the opposite. Yeah, of course. They want, they want an opportunity to work really hard rather than people to yeah. give it to them on a silver platter. Yeah, exactly. And when, I, when you see people like that, I always love to attribute it to the parents. I love to give them the credit for that because it seems like that's what they deserve. You know, I worked, um, as I said, I was a tennis coach. I'm a tennis coach for many years and I worked with a lot of, a lot of kids and the best kids are the ones that are not entitled. They're highly, they're really grateful and they're just having a, a really good time with, with the content. And then, you know, it would, maybe it's my own bias and my own sort of, you know, my own bias and this is making me like um, portray that onto the parents. But whenever I met those really grateful kids, I'd see the parents and they're really grateful and they're like really doing a good job. And then the entitled ones are always, at least in my mind, again, through my own bias and my own lens, were the ones that were, you know, wearing the designer handbags and giving them a much less emotional attachment and much, much less emotional safety. And to me, those things make a difference, or at least it seems to me that those things make a big difference on how they turn out and how they, how they develop. Mm. Like, I don't know. Again, I am biased and all of those things yeah. are my own views. Well, I think you might, I think these Oxbridge kids, for example, are entitled because not, not some attitude that was instilled in them as much as just that was their life. I mean, you know, things come to them on silver platters. And, you know, you yeah. say, well, it's time to wake up, see the real world and everything. But I, I'm, I less attribute um, that I'm, I'm less negative about them than you are, because I think yeah. it, it's not that their parents instilled that in them. It's just their experience. And in a way that makes them yeah. very confident, you know, that sort of thing. So I'm not as negative about that. But the, the other part you're saying about um, uh, gratitude, I would, I would just say they're kind, they're nice people, basically. And that involves a, you know, yeah. aggregation of things. And definitely there's nicer people than others. And one of my early personality studies was trying to show that kindness was um, not as heritable as other traits, because I thought that it was what not the parents... Not as heritable. Now, that I did a study actually asking psychologists, what traits do you think are not, will not show any heritability? This is before okay. it was known that the first law of behavioral genetics is everything heritable. And they came up with things. And pretty high on the list is kindness. You know, that you, it feels like that's something. It's sort of your entitlement thing that, you know, you think people, parents instill that in their kids. And I really thought that too. Yeah. And probably because it's so important to me with my kids, I want them to be kind. So exactly, we, did, yeah. we did a twin study though. Kindness is just as heritable as everything else. And what's that number? About forty percent is here. You know, personality is a little less heritable than, say, cognitive abilities. I mean, not a little. Forty percent versus sixty percent. But and there's some yeah. personality traits that are maybe as low as twenty percent. Some as high as fifty or sixty. But on average, it's about forty percent of the variance is heritable. That means sixty percent is not heritable. But then again, that non -in non inherited environmental component is not nurture. It's this non shared environment. Yeah. That is not what the parents instill in their kids. So I know it's a lot to take on board, but um, it, it, this is like representing the field. I mean, this isn't like my peculiar idiosyncratic take on these things. There's just lots of evidence that's yeah. described in Blueprint to a large extent. Yeah, it's it's super interesting. I really think you need to write the parenting book. To be honest, that that's well, not, that's all I'm getting from this is that that needs to be written because there's there's there'd be so much content in that that we that I'd love to get into. I am. Um, this has been an absolute pleasure. I could go on forever, but I don't, I don't want to take you away for, for that much longer. It's been so much fun. So I'll finish off with um, just kind of a bit rapid fire. Okay. Um, I want to go into the future with genetics. And I'm going to say a few things. And then you're just going to rattle off the first couple of sentences that come into your head. And I'm not putting any time frame on this. So think a decade ahead, you know, like, and you can allow a particular technology to evolve or whatever, whatever comes to your head. I'm curious. So these are all things related to genetics in the future. So CRISPR babies. Um, 
No, for the reasons we described, I think, you know, we're not likely to, that's gene editing for people who don't know what CRISPR is. And so I think for single gene disorders, yes, but as we said, I'm um, probably not for the sorts of psychological complex traits that we study. What about hu human clones? Well, identical twins are clones. And so we know from identical twins that it's not a bad thing to have a clone. There's no more, no greater psychopathology in identical twins from having a clone, as weird as that experience is. So, um, you know, we're cloning dogs, you know that, and yep. people are really getting into the genomics of horse breeding, wherever that's important. So I think without doubt that will happen. And um, what is that, Ex Machina? Was that that movie that, that was about? That's, that's where the AI is installed in... in Oh, that was AI more than it was cloning, but yeah, yeah, was, yeah. I, I, you know, I think, I think this will happen. It definitely could happen. I mean, we could do this, and you know, I it, the the one thing that makes me feel a little less anxious about it is that identical twins really are clones. They're more clones than you or I would be if we had a clone, because that would grow up in a different mother in a different age and all of that. So identical twins are more clones. They're more a clone than any other possibility of cloning. So yeah, so it does happen. It's the simple answer to your question, but it probably will happen. There will be some megalomaniac guys who want to clone themselves. Yeah, Would you that's want what to I was going to say next. Is you think you can? Here's a no, quick question I don't. For you. I don't think. Well, I well, it's it's more fun strictly doing strictly business sense. Like, it, I could do. <laughs> I could do with two of me in the business. You know, trying to run a business having two of me. That that would be that would be sublimely good for business purposes. Um. <laughs> But that's about it. Like, that's the only reason I would think about it is that, God, I'd be so much more productive. I am, um, you know, you could take half the day off and still do the same amount of work. That sounds kind of good. Well, um, there, there are identical not, twins not, in business. Like the, the Winkleman brothers who started, what, Facebook, was it? Yes. They're identical twins. The Winklevoss, and, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Winklevoss, yeah. Yeah. So you think that cloning an adult human might be possible in the next decade? Well, you don't clone adults right you have to clone yeah uh, this is this is why i'm talking about sort of a new a new technology so elon musk starts a company he's 70 yeah. he wants to create a clone of himself that will just develop as an embryo and turn into him is that possible yeah absolutely i mean it'd be like having an identical twin but raised in a different era so it wouldn't be exactly yeah. like him i think it would be more interesting to do what they did with the, the nobel prize sperm bank which was you know, to, um, you know, try, you get lots of different offspring, but you, you capitalize on the genetic variability. Because, you know, if, if these traits are 50% heritable, that means 50% of Elon Musk, of, of say the thousands of Elon Musks we create, you know, there, a lot of that variability, he's not going to recognize as little Elon Musks, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway. DNA dating. Yeah, that's hap that definitely happens. And um, it was a very big thing in the internet about five years ago or so. And it's been kind of regulated down a bit. But you can imagine it's a total natural, isn't it? If you do these dating websites, and you know, instead of good sense of humor, you could actually make available your 23andMe scores to show that you don't have any of these major single gene disorders, for example. You could go beyond that to... Um, amazing film, Gattaca, 1969, before, you know, the, uh, people know this science fiction film. It's a brilliant film, Gattaca. Not sure. G-A-T-T-A-C-C-A, -C -C -A, those are the four letters of the DNA code. And yeah, so yeah. it's a prescient movie. That was before the sequence was genomed, and yet it predicted most of the major developments, like the ones you're talking about, like neonatal screening, DNA dating is in there and using it to select people for jobs. So, but it also made it, it's a dystopia. It took every one of those advances like DNA identification and made it bad because it was a totalitarian government. And they said, we don't want these. They called them invalids, people who didn't have the genetic goods that they wanted. But I think instead, I've written about this, that you could make a positive interpretation that's closer to what's happened because all of those things have come to pass, including DNA dating. Yeah. And the bad side is, you know, pr pretending that you can select a mate gen genomically. But as we were talking about screening out 
you know, recessive disorders is a brilliant thing. And that's sort of DNA dating. It's pre-implantation. Yeah. So Gattaca is a, a, a brilliant film. And I just disagree totally with its conclusions. But it, it was amazing that it could, uh, so prescient. It's just an amazing film. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. I am. Um... What about DNA augmentation? And what I mean by augmentation is, so you're not trying to cure anything. You're not trying to silence anything. You're just trying to augment what's there. So an, an example might be, you know, um, giving someone a gene that codes for more photoreceptors. So a painter could see m more spectra of colors is one example of how you might augment the genes. And do you see any technologies in that area of science fiction that could, come, could become a reality? Well, if you could cure, if you could um, fix a mutant gene that you don't want, like cystic fibrosis, you could fix a gene in the other direction, supposedly. But the problem is we're not talking about single genes. So you'd want to correct a single gene mutation, but that it's a wholly different thing to say you're going to put in a good gene, because what is a good gene? You know, it's a gene that exists. It's not a mutation. So I don't see where that's going to go. Plus, it's that problem we said before. We have trillions of cells. You're not going to change all those cells. You're not going to change the trillions of cells in the brain, for example. So I don't really see yeah. that. Where people worry about that, the augmentation, is that in vitro fertilization, where we touched on the fact that you and your spouse are carriers of cystic fibrosis. You go in, you have the test, and not only do you find you get one quarter of those embryos have a double recessive so that they, they're going to get cystic fibrosis, you screen those out, that's no problem. But then you're left with eight. Which ones do you put in? Well, do you say, well, yeah. just pick one at random? Or do you say, well, this one has these other medical disorders? Or you can get into the positive side, as you're saying. So disorders, people kind of understand, which you, you wouldn't put in a kid with other medical disorders either. But, but then you still have four left. And one of these is going to have a higher IQ. One of them is going to be taller. One of them is going to be obese or whatever. You know, it would be it would be difficult not to, to take advantage of that, I think. So that is yeah. augmentation, and that could happen today. You could do that. In fact, there's one company that's um, Genomic Prediction that does provide that service to parents. They say yeah. they, don't give parents, they don't give parents information about intelligence. But if you were paying $50,000 for this service, you say, wait a minute, you got that information? That's my information. I want to know that, you know? Yeah. So I yeah. can't believe it doesn't happen because in adoption, the main thing in New York, there are these, it's like cattle. There are these books of, you know, that you can, you can sperm bank books, for example. And the number, um, so you, in in vitro, you could select someone else's sperm to use and you could get someone's sperm that's very good. But it, I, what I was thinking of especially is that um, in, in adoption, when parents are, are thinking of adopting a child, there are, you can find out about things about the biological parents. And the number one thing people want to know about is in intelligence related things, like did they go to university, that sort of thing. So that's augmentation too. And we all do it because of something called assorted mating. So people might think there's, you know, intelligence, they'd say just in what intelligence test measure, but you know, at some level, some people are more intelligent than others. And in fact, when you're single and you go to a bar and you pick someone up, within a few minutes, you can measure their verbal ability. And you do. Because the assorted mating, the, the extent to which spouses correlate, is higher for verbal ability than everything else. For height, you might think there's a correlation. There is. 0.2. And for personality, 0.1. For verbal intelligence, 0.6. That's interesting. So, height is more it, correlated than personality? I wouldn't yeah. have guessed that. I wouldn't actually guess really any correlation in height. Well, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't guess any correlation for personality because there's so many personality traits. Yeah, and, it's very hard and to just one personality. If you're very board, active and out, you know, say you're emotionally labile, you might think you go for someone. You wouldn't. Would you go for someone who's also emotionally labile? You might actually go the other way towards someone who's a little more stable. And the fact that you're very sociable, the other one isn't so much. That's okay, but. Height, I'm surprised, because you, you see it in the real world. You don't often see two very, one very tall guy with a very short girl, vice versa. But, you know, you see some correlation. Point two is actually called, it, it's the, uh, this 
famous statistician Cohen talked about it as um, uh, the, you can really see that correlation in the real world. I'm sure everybody's noticed there must be some correlation in height, but that correlation is only 0.2. You don't see the correlation for personality so much, but correlation for height is there, 0.2. But here we're talking about 0.6 and, yeah. you know, for, for verbal ability. And when I when you say that and you think about it, people will realize that, that, you know, you talk to someone and in a few minutes you get some sense of their verbal ability. And that's the best correlate. Vocabulary, as I said, is the most highly heritable trait. So that's another example in which we are actually doing genetic uh, augmentation that you were talking about. Yeah, I'm 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 fine with all of those nat the natural genetic augmentation that we're doing. I think it's a really slippery slope when we start doing it artificially, like even the in vitro fertilization, which I know is is an essential option for some people. I just can't see a world where capitalism is the driving of a driver of all innovation where we don't where that just doesn't keep snowballing into people doing designer babies and thinking okay well our last one had blue eyes so we should get a brown eyed one this time and the last one was quite sporty so maybe maybe we want a poet this time and then the third one's going to be a musician to round out the compliment of children and you know yeah. that that just seems almost inevitable to me which is quite scary and and not not a particularly yeah. good one. You know, that turns dystopian quite quickly as well, I think. Well, I think um, one way to think about it, though, is that uh, I think no. genomics is is going to be anti-capitalistic in the sense that I don't see how an insurance-driven health system can work in the era of genomics. You know, because if you know you have a high risk of heart attacks, for example, you could just insure the heck out of yourself, for example. And I think it's one of the reasons why a national health service is the way medical care has to go because even with even with being able to a consumer led sort of health service you know which is the insurance sort of approach you can't do everything for everybody i mean you could be a billionaire and you still can't do everything and so maybe you need a national health service that for example, in the UK, we have NICE is a center, National Institute for Clinical Excellence, where they decide these really tough decisions about, is this drug for cancer worth 50,000 pounds when what it's doing is giving someone three more months of life? But what's the quality? Of you know, those are really tough decisions to make. You sort of yeah. need someone else making those decisions, and certainly rather than on the basis of money. And I think the same could apply at the level of genomics. NHS is currently doing this project with 5 million people. They um, also have a large pilot study of newborns, which is exactly the Gattaca story. Um, and wouldn't it be good, though, if we screened for these single gene mutations early in life so Absolutely. that we can do something about yeah. it? And maybe we could screen before that. We could screen, you know, if everybody, now 5 million people in the UK are going to have their genome sequenced, whole genome sequenced. If couples getting married, why not provide that information about, you know, you, yeah. okay, you guys both know your carriers for this. It's just at a statistical level, it doesn't really cost anything to do this. And with AI, you know, this could all be automated, for example. And then it would take away what you're worried about and I'm worried about is that right now, a lot of this has to do with being able to pay to get this information. Now, the NHS does do yeah. in vitro fertilization, but, you know, as always, it's difficult to get and there's a postcode lottery on it and that sort of thing, whereas rich people can just pay to do this. So I think there are yeah. ways around that concern, that very valid concern you have about this just being capitalistic driven yeah well i hope so and i hope the right regulations are put in place like we were talking about earlier because i don't know if anyone knows how to regulate this because it's all new area i yeah. am um, i think the government can sometimes not be the best at taking the enough scientific advisors in people who actually know what they're talking about in the sciences to obviously mm -hmm. help create regulation around these things i um, but anyway that's that's a whole a whole separate topic so there's one question that i like to ask every every um guest that comes on and it's related to the next decade in neuroscience, like a few of these last questions have been. Um, what are you most scared of about the next decade in behavioral genetics, neuroscience, genetics as a whole, put them all together? What are you most excited about in the next 10 years? And then the inverse of that is that, what are you most scared about? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, the excitement is easy to see. You know, it's the greater and greater ability to predict these genetic um, risks and positive traits uh, from DNA alone. And this just has so many ramifications, like in education, which I'm particularly interested in, being able to predict and prevent reading disability rather than waiting till kids get to school and fail. You know, so there's lots of examples like that. So the positive side, I don't have trouble with. Now, the negative side, I don't have, I don't worry so much about, but there's plenty of people that do. And that's why I say in Blueprint, I'm really a cheerleader here because there's so many people out there you know, who say the sky is falling. And there's, you know, things to worry about, things that, you know, any big advance can be used for good or ill. And, you know, I hope by writing the book, I give people the literacy so that they can approach this intelligently. And in this era of social media, we need a lot more intelligent conversations, you know, uh, agreeing, dis uh, disagreeing agreeably and all of that sort of stuff. So I... So the things people worry about are data breaches. In some ways, there's a big concern about, you know, your genomic information getting out there. But man, we give up so much information by being on social media. And in England, or say, let alone China, you know, facial recognition, uh, there's, you know, it's harder to get too worked up about privacy issues about the DNA sequence. So if you had my 3 billion base pairs of DNA, what are you going to do with that? You know, yeah, uh, so, I, and, I would know what your urine smells like after a particular type exactly. of food, but I'm not sure how malicious. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not too worried about that one. But uh, with the National Health Service, the other concern is often about the one you raised about, you know, is this just going to be for the rich? And are there going to be like genetic casts? We, people already worry about that through regular assortative mating and the idea of moving towards genetic caste systems. I think the answer to that, though, is more democracy and less capitalism in the sense of um, equal opportunity. And that gets us into a whole issue I sort of don't want to get into, but um, you know, <laughs> it's important to recognize that equality of opportunity does not mean equality of outcome. You know, the yeah. founding fathers of yeah. America, they different. said all men are created equal. They didn't mean they're identical. They meant they should be equal before the law. They should be equal in educational opportunities and that sort of thing. But no yeah. teacher standing in a classroom of 30 kids is going to say, if they make educational opportunities equal, all the kids are going to be exactly the same on their test. They're not. And we're going yeah, to have to learn not. to deal with that. But with social mobility, then, in a way, if you buy into meritocracy, you could say, well, at least the kids, you know, have an opportunity to do the best that they can. Now, that means some kids aren't going to do as well as others. But um, that's, that's genetics. And I think we're going to have to deal with that. But it is a, a major issue that with, I mean, if there's social mobility, we show that kids from the, the worst socioeconomic environments, a substantial proportion have the genetic goods to do very well. And so I think it's important to give them the opportunities that might be special opportunities, because otherwise that environment could really make, make it difficult for them to get ahead in life. So, yeah. so anyway, there are definitely, there's lots and lots of people who are concerned about these things, but um, I'm much more into the cheerleading side of it. So that's the best. Even optimistic do. frame of mind. Yeah. Most, most people No, it's good because most people just immediately had something that they were very scared of. It was a very visual idea. They had a full, full fleshed out about how it would just, you know, have huge impact on the world. So it is, it is good to see some optimism. I'm generally an optimist as well. I am Dr. Robert Plowman. This has been an absolute pleasure. It's been so much fun. I've learned an incredible amount. I hope everyone listening has as well. I'm sure they have. I will need to have you on a second time because I have well, I'd like that. Maybe if more questions in front of yeah, me. Yeah, and if you get feedback from your listeners, maybe you know we could discuss some of those. So I'd be pleased to come back. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks very much for asking me. Good luck fun. with the podcast. Thank you so much. I, and I really think everyone should go read Blueprint. It's a fantastic book. Genetics books can be hard and a bit inaccessible. I think Blueprint is a genuinely accessible one. Loads of insanely interesting stuff that I think will just change your mind frame on lots of different aspects but uh it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much thanks Ewan.